I scheduled though, besides the, the, the interactions that I scheduled and shared with you, you would have noticed that, uh, or you will soon notice that, uh, uh, you will soon notice that, uh, uh, just a minute, if you access the course calendar, I think which is available on Astria, what you will notice is that um, there, there are additional events that are being scheduled. And I'm specifically making reference to things like invited speakers and talks. And because it turns out that uh, part of, for me, part of the reason why I do this other than the fact that it's standard practice for this course to be offered, but part of the reason why, why we do some of these things is to give you ideas on what you can potentially work on next year. That's number one. And number two, we are alive to the fact that some of you here are professionals, right? That do these things that we're discussing for a living. Um, and so what we hope is that you'll be able to perhaps do something at work based on some of the concepts that will be introduced in class. Uh, one of the speakers, uh, which is next week on Monday, is the librarian from Zikas, uh, together with the David librarian, we enrolled into the course last year and they got the idea of setting up the institutional repository for Zikas University after we had a discussion um, of digital libraries last year, right? So we are hoping, we're hoping that, you know, we'll be able to pick up some of these things. Uh, sadly though, because of the nature of the interaction, um, things that are more practical oriented in nature are going to be a bit difficult to, to work towards. What has worked for us really well is the workshop approach where we, we dedicate, we'll dedicate time and then uh, uh, we work through like uh, scenarios and light on and other people, uh, students that I work with will move around to help us work through problems that we might be experiencing. I'm not sure how best we can do this other than me walking you through screenshots of things that are somewhat hypothetical. There is a, um, a dedicated segment or lecture series that's tied to a practical walkthrough. Right now it only has a, screencast but I'm sitting here and I'm wondering I'm still wondering how best we are going to have to do this but in terms of the scheduled interactions what I mean is is this here right you'll notice that besides the the normal interactions that we're going to have uh, we have interactions that are likely going to be on Mondays days where we don't have scheduled interactions on Mondays where we invite people from out here to come and talk about some of the things that we introduce in the theory that we're going to cover. So what you notice is people that will come through to talk about um, integrated library management systems and library automation will come through after we cover that lecture series. I'm still trying to think of people we can invite that will come and give talks that are centered around, um, talks that are centered around uh, information retrieval. Um, we'll try and see, if not, we can easily bring in someone who will talk about uh, something that at least is linked to information retrieval. Uh, so this is what I was talking about. There's a new event on Monday. Now the Monday event, unlike these other events you notice is, it begins at 17 because it's going to be random actually because we're at the mercy of the people we're inviting. We have control over these interactions. And by the way, I did mention that these are tentative days or tentative times. We have control over these, which is why we're able to schedule them at 18. It is hoped that by 18 hours, everybody else who is still busy with work would have been done with work or something and would have maybe rested for a little while before um, joining us for class. So that was the idea behind this. Uh, if you wish for us to have this during the day, let me know. I don't have any fourth year classes, so my, my schedule um, is uh, flexible in the mornings and uh, midday. So if you feel like we need to change this from 18 to a different day, to a different time, let me know. All right, so <clears throat> we're going to cover this three modules, modules five, six, and seven in the next three weeks, beginning this week. Uh, and we are going to begin with module number five, which is digital libraries. Uh, just had a sound here, let me just see. Okay. I hope you can see my screen. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. I'll assume the king. I don't think they can, I'll have to show you. Can you see my screen? No. Not yet? We're able to see it. 
Okay, so the calendar I think is there on Astra. Yeah. This is what I was this is what I was referring to. Everybody has access to this calendar. So if you look at the calendar, while these these interactions are set in stone, unless if people want us to change the times, the the dates linked to the people that are coming through to give these talks. Um, I know we have about three people so far that have expressed interest. Uh, we're trying to see if we can invite two more people, right? Uh, so the person from Zikas is coming through on Monday. Uh, the acting institutional repository manager for uh, the investor of Zambia hasn't yet responded, but uh, it's either he's coming through maybe on Tuesday or maybe it could be one of these days, in which case we'll start at 17, he ends his talk and then we continue our interaction. Uh, this is next week, by the way, this is this week, and then this is next week, right? <clears throat> Anyway, uh, right, and then something else, another important thing that I, I sent by email was uh, the fact that we are tentatively scheduling the, the, the test for this, uh, this uh, the test for the week of, uh, August. the week of August 3rd, right, so, <clears throat> And I did mention that the test is going to cover the stuff you covered with Dr. Piri and uh, and, uh, and the content we're going to cover, at least the content we're going to cover in this, in this particular interaction. So the, 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 the test is actually scheduled for this particular period. All right. Uh, right, unless if there are any questions, I'm just going to proceed now. Concerns? Sorry. Okay, so I'm, I'm muting people here, but if you can mute your microphones, that'd be good. Uh, but, but feel free to unmute as we're walking through this. All right. So module number five uh, this week, we we are going to go through um, this this particular module uh, in the following order, right? So we start today by looking at an introduction to digital libraries. Um, and then tomorrow we look at fundamental concepts. Uh, on Friday, we get to look at uh, tools and services associated with these things we're calling digital library management systems. Uh, and really the central focus is almost always exclusively on open source software tools, uh, just because we can easily gain access to these tools. Granted, uh, there are commercial versions of digital library software tools and services out there. So if you come from a, a rich institution, that is able to make a subscription to, uh, I guess, a platform like Xlibre, for instance, you could do that. Um, CDS in Venue, I think, is a commercial vision, if I'm not mistaken, as well. So, but, but our focus is usually on open source tools. And then on Saturday, the idea is to, to have some sort of practical, let's see, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Well, I, I think we combine we combine four and five into one day. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday we wrap up by looking at just a quick practical walk through, and then some open research questions. Uh, the reason we almost always have an open research question type of interaction is again, in the event that there are people that are interested in carving out a research problem that is aligned with this, um, that's the kind of uh, lecture series we use to make mention of things like uh, publication venues that are linked to digital libraries and other subfields um, associated with what we're going to talk about. Um, and then things like uh, interesting labs and people out there that are doing research that is all aligned with digital libraries. <clears throat> right. So this is going to be the plan for now. Uh, we can make things up as we go along. If we run out of time, I'm guessing we can always take time. I'm going to ask whoever has a microphone uh, or to mute it, perhaps. So in terms of introduction, this is what we're going to go through. I, I, I thought we would, uh, would have a brief introduction because what I noticed was uh, when, when I did more or less like a review of what Dr. Piri probably talked about, the idea I had in mind when I, I, I shared those videos and notes was I was trying to focus more on this idea of how information is transmitted on a network because it turns out that most of these integrated library management systems and so-called digital library management systems that we're going to discuss and that you interact with 
are fundamentally web-based in nature. And because they're web-based in nature, the idea behind how information and data is transmitted as people are accessing uh, or interacting with such tools, make use of those fundamental principles. Um, <clears throat> so something else we're going to talk about here is this notion of uh, content management systems, right? It turns out that all these integrated library management systems and digital library management systems are fundamentally content management systems. And the principle is the same. On the front end, you have an interface that is implemented using a markup language like HTML, for instance. Of course, interactivity makes use of things like JavaScript, right? Or server-side scripting. Um, on the back end, the dynamic content is stored in the database management system, right? So it's one of the reasons why I shared the previous batch of screencasts uh, that I shared and, and the lecture series, which is stuff that you probably covered with the paper theory. Uh, but anyway, so this is the outline of, uh, of unit 6.1, essentially. Uh, <clears throat> a reminder, right, uh, that everything we're talking about here during our discussion of so-called digital library management systems or digital libraries is fundamentally linked to this idea of computer-based information systems or information systems, right? And this is really loosely tied to the title of 5310. Uh, and we're talking about, when we're talking about computer-based information systems, those five key things come into play, right? This idea that you need a dedicated piece of hardware, which you're going to use to uh, host whatever, whatever piece of software or application you want to, to interact with or to have people, end users interact with. That piece of software will probably need prerequisite software components, especially if it's web-based. There are sub-components that were introduced to us, things like um, web servers, for instance, um, but not only that, you need a communications infrastructure because it turns out that if the vast majority of these computer-based information systems are web-based, then what we're saying is you need some sort of communication infrastructure that people are going to use to connect to this web-based platform. Seeing as the vast majority of these web-based platforms, integrated library management systems, digital library management systems are fundamentally or fundamentally work with dynamic content, what that means is that in the back end, you need a database management system that is going to be used to store the data or the dynamic content, right, uh, that the application works with. Well, importantly though, um, you have people that come into play here. And, and we, dis we, we discovered when we went through the, the first module the period that when we talk about people, there's a broad spectrum of people and profiles of people. Uh, you'd be looking at the actual end users that get to interact with the computer-based system, uh, the computer-based information system. So if it's a common computer-based system that we are used to like Astria, you're looking at people like the students, uh, lecturers, but behind the scenes, you have people that take care of that platform, right? Administrators, system administrators. There are people that are interested in generating statistics from there. Like they might be interested in trying to see, people from IDE might be interested in trying to see how many people that have enrolled into the MLIS program are actually accessing Astria. Right? I mean, those are obvious managerial, managerial functions, but fundamentally it's people. But besides that, you have procedures, right? Again, if we were to latch onto the example of Astria as an example, computer-based information system, it doesn't matter whether it's Astria or it's DSpace or if it's Omeka, there are usually procedures. One of the procedures we have in place is before you can gain access to Astria, you must be fully registered. If you're not registered, you will not have access to Astria, right? Uh, so I had a discussion about this and I thought I'd rub it in to remind us that whether we're discussing digital library management systems, whether we're discussing information retrieval systems, which is what we are discussing in module number six, fundamentally what we're looking at is a computer-based information system. And these key principles still hold. The fact that the system that we are looking at can be viewed as being a combination of these five key aspects. No matter how you look at it, these key, key aspects are actually involved in your typical computer-based information system. All right, uh, whether it's uh, Koha, OPAC, DSpace, Omeka, Astria, Moodle, same principle holds. Uh, 
but of particular interest and something we're going to focus our attention on when we're discussing digital libraries in our case is the component of the computer-based information system which was defined as being loosely associated with information technology, right? So that's the top layer here, those four components. So your hardware, your software, and the communication infrastructure, and the database management systems that you're utilizing, or the data sources, it doesn't have to be a database management system. You could use a file system to store these things. That infrastructure is what we are calling information technology. <clears throat> technology. And what you'll notice is that these, these aspects will actually come up. In certain instances, I will explicitly remind us of which aspects, oh, I thought someone wanted to come in here. I'll remind us of which particular aspect we're dealing with, whether it's hardware or software or communication infrastructure. Uh, but most instances will be really silent. The idea is you'll be able to pick these things up as we're discussing. And, and this, is, this is where it gets really interesting, right? Because, uh, and I do hope you'll be able to pick this up by the time we're done here. But the idea that, um, irrespective of what sort of computer-based information system you're looking at, you'd, you'd best understand that computer-based information system from this perspective, really, right? These five key aspects. <clears throat> uh, something that I also always mention when we have this, uh, or when I have a lecture that is related to what we're talking about now is trying to emphasize that this top layer here, when you're looking at implementing something similar, whether it's at work or during a research project, what you discover is that the top part is the easiest part to implement. The difficulty is always people and procedures. And I am hoping, I do apologize, I need to let someone in. I'm hoping that uh, uh, Zachary, the acting institutional repository manager for uh, the University of Zambia will actually carve out his talk in such a way that he focuses on a so-called IR policy that has uh, has been in the making for years now, right? Uh, if you look at the the UNSA institutional repository, you would be shocked, right? You'd be shocked to learn that that um, content. And I guess this is the best time for us to maybe start uh, looking at examples. Also, if you were to look at the content that people are uploading into the repository, we have control over content that is associated with postgraduate students, aka ETDs, those master students and PhD students that graduate. The reason we have control is because the RGS has come up with a policy or procedures that mandate that each particular dissertation produced uh, by a graduate from the University of Zambia is eventually going to end up in the institutional repository. We do not have a policy in place that forces either implicit or explicitly, that forces faculty staff to upload content into the repository. This is the reason why you have very strange things, right? If you look at content coming in from the School of Engineering, we only have one preprint. One preprint which was authored in the 2000. Now here's the thing, we know that people from the School of Engineering generate or conduct research, they publish, but because we do not have explicit processes and procedure. There's no policy. There's nothing that forces people to do that. And there, as a result, you have this sort of uh, messed, up, mess, messed up situation here. This doesn't make sense. IDE, four publications, doesn't make sense. Law, only one publication, no ways, right? School of Education, this might be deceiving, but this doesn't make sense because the School of Education alone has over 130 faculty staff. Now, if we're saying that this institutional repository, which is also a digital library management system, by the way, is supposed to be used to archive research that has been generated by all faculty staff at the University of Zambia from the time the university was actually commissioned or opened, then it doesn't make sense that we only have 82. We should have thousands of publications. Again, the problem is with people and policies and procedures. If you decide to do this at work, if you are, if, if you are employed uh, somewhere, like I think we have a librarian from, uh, is it Lev uh, Monawas, I think, if my memory says me right. If you don't have an institutional repository and part of what you are planning to do 
uh, after we're done with this course is to come up with an implementation. And by the way, we can cover out a research project tied to that. So if you're interested, we can tie, talk behind the sidelines here. You must think about people and procedures. Very important. And this thing will come up again once we discuss integrated library management systems. People are always a problem. The top part is, the top part you can finish in a week. Uh, when we were interacting with the people from Zika's, for instance, when they were setting up the repository. The setting up of the repository was done in less than a week, right? The installation process, just a pity that we won't have a walkthrough where we, we get to experience how to install uh, open source plat platforms like DSpace or Fedora Commons or Omeka, but the installation process can be done in, 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 a, in an hour, less than an hour actually, right? Setting up the hardware, that's not a problem, the only bottleneck would be like purchasing the hardware, but I'd like for us to just keep this at the back of our minds, right? Technology, very easy. Bottom part, difficult thing. Uh, we focus on the technology. Um, right, so before we start our discussion of digital libraries, uh, to remind us of how these web-based, computer-based information systems will typically work, they take advantage of the so-called client server architecture, where upon you have a number of clients that will be interested in accessing a resource. All right, so again, I'm gonna be latching on to an example of Astria because we're used to Astria here. If you look at Astria as being uh, a computer-based uh, system that we use as an example here, you will notice that at any given point in time, you have hundreds, perhaps thousands of people accessing Astria. How do we know this? Because we know that we have a number of students that uh, I know that the University of Zambia is in the uh, distance mode of instruction. When there's a test, for instance, or an exam, an online exam, you typically have a number of people accessing the same resource at any given point in time. Uh, so this resource here could be viewed as, uh, this resource is a piece of hardware where Astria is installed, and these clients here would be people like you and me. So when I go to, when I go to log in to Astria, uh, and I, Ooh. This is interesting. When I when I go to log into, if I can just log into Astria here, if I go to Astria to log into Astria, I'm a client. Now it's not like I am a client as a human being, but uh, my computer is actually the client, right? And I could do the same thing with my with my mobile device, which I do quite often, right? So. So this would be me, this would be everybody here right now, right? This would be the clients themselves. And the way this works is it works using the so-called client server architecture where you have numerous clients accessing a resource that's out there on the internet or on the network, right? This is a network resource. And if you remember uh, your discussion with Dr. Piri with regards to, to how uh, a network works and why a network is there is fundamentally what we, what we are doing on the network is we are sharing resources, we are exchanging data and information. Resources, network printers, resources, uh, computer, uh, computing resources, right? Uh, in instances where I, I guess, um, it's a pity you haven't uh, looked at, you haven't uh, been to the Odell laboratory but, but resources could be by way of um, uh, a shared file server, which is used to enable people to save files on the network, right? Backup files on the network, all right? Uh, so the principle is the same. Uh, and really, in a nutshell, in summary, what typically happens is, uh, is a, 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 a request that is initiated by the client. So this client machine, we initiate interaction with the server, right? Uh, so you initiate interaction by specifying the resource that you're interested in, right? So it could be a file, maybe a PDF file if you're downloading one of the modules or one of the files. Uh, it could be a, an actual HTML page if you're interested in just uh, accessing a resource similar to uh, what I just opened up here. This itself, the page itself I've, I've landed on is a resource in itself, right? What I've clicked here is a resource. What type of resource? It's an HTML resource. Right, what comes back is an HTML page that is rendered by my web browser. Uh, I'm just gonna pause here and check if people are online, maybe not. <clears throat> All right, 
Uh, it's happened in the past that I've lost connection and boom. Uh, but anyway, the interaction, the way it starts is the client will send through a request and then the server will try and process the request by checking what sort of service the client normally, well, the client is interested in. For web-based systems or platforms, we mentioned, or Dr. Piri mentioned, that effectively you are accessing that resource using a specific port, which is port 80, right? Port 80 is normally linked to uh, things that you access by using the hypertext transfer protocol, right? So either HTTP or HTTPS. HTTPS is nothing more than a secure version of HTTP, right? This, by the way, these things here I'm regurgitating, I shared those two screencasts. Well, back, I was trying to give us um, a bit of background information so that we're able to understand what's going on here. Uh, so the server processes your request. It knows that you're looking for an HTML page. It sends that request to the actual application server, which is hosting the application, in this case, the Astria application, and it tells the application to say, uh, this is what this person wants. And then in the case of Astria, it, a page will be dynamically created, an HTML page will be dynamically created, and then it will be sent to you, to you in the form of a response. You as a client. But all this happens really quickly, really. Uh, and what you get back is this sort of view, right? This is a response. And in fact, if you want, I don't know if Dr. Piri mentioned this when you look at this, but you can actually, you can, you can literally uh, see what's happening as you are requesting these resources. Observe. If I, if I want to access a new resource, let's say the module page here, I'm just gonna copy the resource. By the way, feel free to interrupt me if these things are not making sense, if you need clarification, although we're not here to talk about this, but if I'm looking for this resource, this is, not, this is the URL to the resource, right? Uniform resource locator, but we mentioned, or Dr. Piri mentioned that this uniform resource locator will have the host name. This is the host name. It will have the protocol that you're using to access the resource. Optionally, you shall have a port. By default for most, not for most, but for all uh, resources that you are accessing using HTTP protocol, it's port number 80. Someone wants to come in. So it's port number eight. So you can break down this resource that we're accessing here in so many different interesting ways here. Uh, like protocol used, HTTPS, uh, the host name or the computer, the network node, the actual computer that has the resource that you want. The name of this computer is elaining.unza.vdm. The resource that you're interested in is this part here. So really the, the remote computer will know by looking at these different components to say, oh, this, this client actually is looking for this resource here, right? Uh, port by default here, actually for HTTPS, it's, is it 465? Uh, HTTPS 465. HTTP, by the way, these are not coming, but this sort of mentioned them, uh, port 80. So break it down like this. Oh, we, we discovered uh, that in fact, this, the, as far as the computer is concerned, there's no such thing as elearning.unza.zm. There's what Dr. Perry introduced as an IP address, right? So this e-learning thing here is mapped onto an IP address. And in the case of Astria, what happens when you use your web browser by going to HTTPS elearning.unza.zm is the web browser behind the scenes will, uh, I mean, there's a couple of like network translation that happens. And in fact, what you're accessing is that. Right, and if you want to prove this, you can log in uh, incognito and just type in this IP address, and hopefully we should be able to. Ooh, this is. Uh, I wonder if uh, this this was uh, this was uh, uh, pause for a while here. Let's let's try and uh, do this. Now it's because I was using protocol number eighty here, by the way. So I'm gonna, I hope this is the part where demos don't work. I'll do HTTPS and then I'll type in the IP address. And then uh, it's asking me to proceed here. I hope this works. It should be able to work. Please work, uh, at least we embarrass ourselves and then boom, right? So you notice that even though I used an IP address, right? I used this access that resource. 
but because but because but but because I know that elearning.unza.zdm is mapped onto that IP address. I know that what I expect is the same as elearning.unza.zdm. Again, all these gory details are really important. We're not here to discuss that, but I thought I would uh, introduce these things because uh, it turns out that maybe they might be useful, maybe not, maybe, but I think they will be. These are important things to learn about, right? And then also, something else is, I'm thinking, you're sitting there and you're wondering, but what about the port? By default, I think HTTPS here. Uh, I guess you can look this up. It should be 465, default port, HTTPS. It should be, it's 443, sorry, it's 443. So to test this, I could go to this resource and explicitly say, I want to access uh, 443 or something. Or I want to access this resource using port 443. Hopefully you should be able to work, but I'm here to show people how this works, I guess, but uh, maybe it's nice to look at these things. I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully you should be able to work. Uh, please work and then boom, it works, right? So fundamentally, really, we can break down this request that we're talking about into constituent parts. Um, and all this is important because you're dealing with a web application, a web-based application, web-based a web -based computer information system computer-based information system. So many different uh, components associated with such an application that were introduced to us when we had uh, that residential screen interaction with Dr. Peary. Behind the scenes, content is being dynamically generated by being, uh, it's the dynamically being generated by, uh, by the application pulling information from a relational database management system. And then an HTML page is dynamically created and then you see this, all of this, is pulled from the database, or at least most of it is pulled from the database. And by the way, um, most of these applications that we are calling web-based, computer-based uh, information systems are fundamentally content-based, uh, content management systems. They work using a very simple principle. They are database-driven. And because they're database-driven, all the content that you work with is dynamically pulled or generated or created from a database. This applies to institutional repository, most digital library management systems, or these integrated library management systems, the cohas of this world, uh, the OPAX of this world, all of these are fundamentally content management systems. And again, uh, I assume that maybe in the event that you didn't discuss with the Tapiri, the, one of the batches of screencasts that I shared talked about, I do hope, but the notes do speak to content management systems, right? Where we said the idea behind content management system is somewhat similar to how this client server interaction kind of like works. Uh, the only thing is that the content is dynamically pulled from a database which sits on the server. So when the client initi initiates contact with the server, or it makes a request to the server, that request is processed by way of pulling information from the database and then the content is used to dynamically generate uh, um, an HTML page usually that is sent back to the user, right? That's the principle behind the content management system. Uh, uh, also in, in the notes that I shared in the last uh, batches of features that I shared, uh, I went through uh, some examples of content management systems. It turns out you can cluster them. There are generic ones, there are uh, some content management systems that are specific to a particular domain. Popular generic ones are the ones that are used to implement websites, for instance, or web applications, right? Uh, so things like the UNSA website uses a generic content management system that is referred to as Drupal. It's freely available, it's open source. If you want, you can download it today, install it, and then create a website of your own. Previously, the UNSA was running Joomla, yet another content management system. But because these applications, these things we're calling content management systems have become so very useful insofar as so-called web 2.0 is concerned, there are hundreds of them out there. Um, if you want to do this for fun, what you can do is you can go to, you can go to Wikipedia and just say content management systems. You can do a comparison, a uh, list of content management systems. You notice that Wikipedia lists hundreds of them, right? 
they're actually listed based on, uh, in certain instances, a particular domain, whether they are freely available and open source, whether they are used for a particular functionality, like for records management, uh, as is the case for Frisco, for instance, uh, whether they're generic in nature, right? Uh, whether they are used to implement uh, a typical digital library management system or an institutional repository, a document management system, as is the case for this space. These are all content management systems, and there are a lot of them, right? Right? So just a few examples for generic ones that are used to implement web applications or websites. Uh, I also like to uh, plug in, this is a shameless plug, my personal blog, which is accessible here, runs a content management system called WordPress probably one of the most widely used content management systems. Uh, but there are also content management systems that are used to uh, create or implement so-called learning management systems. Examples or classic examples of learning management systems are the Astrias of this world. So this application we keep calling Astria is a content management system. Moodle is a content management system that is specific to uh, educational institutions, or higher education domains really. So if you're looking to setting up an learning management platform, so a platform that you use to archive in, uh, teaching and learning materials and to administer or manage uh, teaching and learning activities, then you destroy a learning management system. I'm going to pause here just to check if people are online. It's quiet on the Western front here. Okay, all right, they're there. Thank you for that. Uh, but also, here's the thing, right? If you want to get to specifics, these are just some examples. Now, some of these examples, I use them because I've, I've used these in the past. So, Astria, this thing we are calling Astria, is set up using an open source learning management system called Canvas. If you look up Canvas LMS, you'll be able to see that you can freely download this canvas and set it up. So if you work for an institution where during this COVID-19 pandemic, you've been told, can you look for oh, uh, a platform that you can use to implement online learning? Canvas is one of those platforms. You would use Canvas if you want to come up with a learning management system that is similar to what you see when you're using Astria. So if you like what you see when you're using Astria, to be honest, I don't quite like what I see when I use Astria, um, you can use Canvas. But I quite like what I see when I'm using Moodle. Moodle is another learning management system, which is a content management system that is specific for a particular domain, right? So again, this thing we are calling Moodle is available for free. You can download it today, install it, and set it up for your organization. Now, your organization doesn't necessarily have to be a teaching and learning organization or a high school, higher, an institution of higher learning or uh, is it a higher learning institution, H-E-A, higher education institution, right? Um, maybe you work for an environment where you are a training manager or something, and you organize a lot of training activities and you want to start archiving these training so courses, the property management training courses. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Yeah, sorry, Doc. Uh, oh, I yeah. just want to find out on the on the canvas and the Moodle. You yeah. said canvas is a, is it also free software? Yes, you can download it today for free. Now, now I like saying this. I know I'm recording this, but I'll say it out right now. <laughs> Unza pays a lot of money for this thing we're calling Astria. The company, right? The company that uh, provides that service to just downloaded Canvas, a freely available tool, set it up on some cloud service provider out there. It's on Amazon, by the way, you can see it here, right? It's on Amazon servers. Set it up in the cloud, and then Unza pays a subscription. But the service they're providing is, in the event that there's a problem, someone from IDE will just call the people responsible for Astria. I've forgotten the name of the company, to say there's a problem, and then they'll work on the problem. In fact, that's what UNSA is paying for, it's a service, right? But if you are coming from an institution or an organization that is cash strapped, what you want to do is think about just setting up the, this platform on your own. That's all, right? and then you can do this on your own. But, but here's the thing, the, the reason I'm talking about this, by the way, is because it comes up when we discuss library automation. 
we have a separate discussion where we look at the pros and cons of open source software. This, this has commercial versions of this software tools that we are discussing, right? So do not be deluded by thinking we'll cut costs by doing what Zikas is doing and we install our own disk space. Yeah. We manage it our, on our own. It turns out that you might be forced to hire people that will need to manage those platforms. What you'd have to do as an organization is see it and uh, uh, I guess weigh, weigh the pros and cons of uh, paying money, subscription fee where someone manages this pl platform for you or hire someone to manage this platform for you. What works for the UNSA is there's already people that are paid that work for CICT that are responsible for running the infrastructure on UNSA. So we are able to get away with setting up uh, these platforms on our own, except for Astria, I guess. But it turns out that there's more in terms of learning management systems, right? We, by the way, we're discussing content management systems here still. It turns out that these digital library management systems are also content management systems that we're trying to set the stage. This is why I'm talking about this. There are other examples. In the past, or rather right now, there's a course that I am involved with where we use Google Classroom. Now we're able to use Google Classroom because UNS assigned an MOU with Google, and so we have access to these Google services. Like we use Google Meet for free, but this is a premium service. A regular person out there would have to pay money, I think, right, to access Google Meet. So besides Google Meet, we also have access to Google Classroom. Google Classroom is also a content management system. It does the same exact thing that Astria does, the same exact thing that Moodle does, the same exact thing that Sekai does. Manages administration of teaching and learning activities, submission of assignments, uploading of content, right? Communication with students. Automatic upload of assignments. Same thing, just different. It's like, uh, oh, I'm... Um, I'm a black person, whatever that means. I'm Caucasian, I'm Indian, I'm Asian. So we're all human beings, right? It turns out that there's more though. If you're interested, fun fact, there's also Sakai. My alma mater still runs Sakai. If you are interested in looking at how Sakai looks like. Also a content management system, but a specific type of content management system is called a learning management system. Sakai looks like what you're seeing right now. The interface might be different, it looks different, but behind the scenes, what you're doing is the same. You send announcements, you have a calendar, you have resources, you have sites that are created, you can chat with students, you can have students upload assignments, it's the same thing, right? But it turns out that besides this content management, these learning management systems, there's other things, right? And this is just examples here of learning management systems, Moodle and uh, Astria or Canvas. There's more. Our discussion is centered around this space. What you will soon see in one of the lecture series that we set up is we look at the broad spectrum of digital library management systems that are out there. Now we will discuss when and where we might want to use these particular systems, but the key takeaway point here is there's a lot of them. Even though people will, for the most part, talk about, oh, this space, this space, this space, it's not just this space that's out there. There's ePrints, there's Fedora Commons, there's Faze, there's Omeka, there's Greenstone, right? Um, the thing you have to do as an expert in this area is you must be able to narrow down on a particular platform that would be appropriate for the needs at hand. So for instance, if you're one of those people who would want to set up an institutional repository, what you will soon discover is that it would be a lot easier for you to either use this space or ePrints because effectively what you're setting up is a document repository actually. If you're setting up a cultural heritage type of platform, then you might explore Greenstone or Omeka because part of what, part of what you do is you can use those tools to create what are called exhibits, right? To properly render images if, if part of that uh, cultural heritage like collection is going to to render like images from the past or something. And we talk about this very soon, but just wanted to make mention of the fact that there is a broad spectrum of these things we are calling content management systems. Generic ones, one specific to domains like uh, teaching and learning domains, one specific to uh, domains like li library environments, I suppose, right? If you're looking at setting up a document repository, an institutional repository, cultural heritage uh, collection, for instance, um, 
you'd be setting up something similar to this. Now, this image just showcases an example, right, which is this space. There are more images coming where we'll look at, uh, we'll look at these other platforms. There are a lot of them, by the way, hundreds of them, right? And by the way, the sheer size of the number of applications gives you an idea of how important that domain is. Because, let's see if I can find that um, on slide number 23. Because, we, we, because this is such an important area, what you will soon discover is that, I hope I won't forget slide number 23. What you soon discover is that if you go to websites like, uh, oh, can't find what I'm looking for. No, I feel stupid, I can't. Uh, I have no idea where that is, but these times like this when I wish there was a hyperlink. But if, if oh, maybe here, for comparison, boom. If you go to pl platforms like Open Door, right, or here, what you soon discover is that these people will list the different types of tools that are out there. Hundreds of them, right? So it will be up to you as, as an expert to be able to decide to say, well, I think if we were to set up, uh, if, if we want to set up a document repository, then we should either look at ePrints or DSpace and uh, what else is there? ePrints or DSpace or ETDM, well, ETDDB, right? I don't know if ETDDB is here, it's not here. Or maybe ETDDB, right? Uh, and then once you narrow down to the specifics, you draw up like a matrix that will be able to identify pros and cons of the different tools. Uh, and then you decide to say, oh, we're going to go for ePrints. In certain instances, it might be familiarity, right? If you've you, you, you are familiar with this space and you maybe choose this space. But again, we have a dedicated session where we'll look at uh, some of these factors that you look at when you're narrowing down on the specifics. Uh, I do hope this is kind of making sense. Again, we're just looking at, uh, we might have forgotten some things introduced to us. This is the recap, CMSs. This should have been introduced to us during our discussion of networking, right? If not, that's fine. Uh, it's not very important, but uh, which is why we're having this discussion nonetheless. But there's more, right? Uh, if you are looking at setting up a wiki, for instance, a platform, a content management system that will allow people to collaboratively edit content, you'd have to set up a wiki. A slew of uh, wiki software out there, similar to uh, learning management systems, you can go online and just go say wiki software, or wiki software on Wikipedia, you'll find a list of wiki software. Because this is important, you will find hundreds, maybe, maybe almost hundreds of different types of wiki software, right? You can have, you can go to this comparison page on Wikipedia and then boom, you notice this? These are all potential wiki software. Most of these are open source, by the way. Some of them are proprietary, you need to pay money. Um, but you can set these up in your organization, then you can have people collabor collaboratively provide content. I guess the choice is up to you to decide on whether you need a wiki at your institution or not, right? Uh, what you'll notice is that most learning management systems will, will integrate a wiki as part of that uh, as part of that uh, as part of that learning management system. Here's what I mean. If I go to Sakai, for instance, you'll notice that. Uh, oh, let me see if there's a site that has um, a provision for a wiki. Do I remember? I think the ICT for D page. It should have a wiki page. So in the learning management system, you have. Uh, a wiki, right? It's, it's, it works on the same principle. So people can, different people can collaboratively edit this page, right? And you can even view things like um, a history of who, uh, and I hope Lightone is here. I used to edit this because, yeah. Uh, who edited what, when, right? But the key thing is people can collaboratively edit content. It's not just Sakai, really. On Moodle, I mean, on Moodle, you can do the same thing. You can add a wiki, right? It's, it's so, it, I guess the takeaway point here is it's a type of a CMS. It's so important that you even have it embedded or integrated within, within other content management systems. I hope a wiki is here. There we go. So I can create a wiki within Moodle, right? Collaboration. Anyway, it turns out that this is just a, a, a category and the, there are a number of examples out there. Uh, classic example I want to give here is, uh, in case you're wondering, this thing you call Wikipedia, this is set up using an open source application called MediaWiki, right? MediaWiki is available for free. 
Media Wiki, sorry, Media Wiki is not the only uh, wiki software that you can use. You can use Moin Moin. I've used DocuWiki in the past and Moin Moin. I've never used PH, PHP Wiki, but there are a lot of them. Anyway, bottom line is just another different type of example, classic case of Media Wiki here. I hope that kind of helps set the stage for this introduction. Uh, the way packets and data are transmitted in your typical web-based application using the so-called client server model. Client initiates a request. Request is processed by the server. Server responds to the client by sending through what the client requested for, provided what the client requested for is available on the server. If it's not available, an error comes up. And we see this a lot. If I go to, if I go to the, the server that houses, uh, that houses, um, that houses uh, Astria, <clears throat> excuse me. And instead of, instead of me specifying this resource here, I hope this is making sense. I do apologize if I'm waffling around, but I'm trying to make sure that this kind of makes sense. If I go to, to Astria and say, I want this resource, I'll get back this. But observe, what if I say, I want a resource that, that is equivalent to courses slash 27336 slash uh, modules list 5310. Because this, I know for a fact that this resource does not exist, I will get back an error. Behind the scenes, the server will process the request for you. But once, once it goes to the application server, the application server will respond and say, oh, but, but that page doesn't exist. Right? You still get back a response, but it's a more informative response. Similar to when you get back a useful response, right? You will still get back a response that in this case is in form of an HTML page, really, to be honest. It's an HTML page. Uh, <clears throat> all right, I hope the introduction is good enough. Uh, I guess now would be a time to start looking at uh, why digital libraries, right? Uh, unless if there are any specific questions people have, let's pause to see if I'm making sense or not. Am, am I making sense or not? I don't know. No, okay. <clears throat> uh, I'm wondering if uh, Ms. Jacqueline is at work. I see there's a mask here. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm glad that people are giving masks here. We're pausing, it's like that, that break, right? A message from our response. Uh, when I go to campus now, people have stopped putting on masks, apparently because only, is it 24 people have died or something? And I see two people like that. I, I burned something, so there was smoke everywhere in the oh. house. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. I, see, I see that sort of behavior to be somewhat reckless, right? Especially that uh, people behaving like this people from, institution of higher learning. But anyway, when an expert tells you that uh, this is going to happen, you should take that seriously. There's a the reason why they're saying that, because their statement is rooted in evidence. If I come up to you and you're an expert librarian, and they tell you to say, I want to do ABCD. Uh, I want to, to uh, we just set up a school and we want to set up a library. What's the starting point? You tell me what to do and I decide to do something contrary different. Uh, I'll start questioning if you are the librarian, you should question my thinking because as, as an expert, you know better than I do. But I digress, we're not here to talk about that. Uh, apparently more people have died. Last time I checked, I think the number had swelled beyond 24. Uh, may their souls rest in peace. So before we start our discussion here, right? Uh, it's, it's important to kind of look at the motivation behind why, why digital library management systems and why digital libraries arose, right? It turns out that the motivation really stems from the fact that uh, if you look, if you trace back what has been happening over the last couple of decades, you notice that there's increasingly massive amounts of information that is generated. Now this, this information could either be born digital, in which case it's already in electronic form. Uh, in certain instances, there are people that are busy embarking upon so-called digitization projects where they are digitizing previously documents that were in physical form. The UNS has been doing this for years now, by the way. A number of manuscripts that are available. Apparently you can access them in the special collection. So digitizing all those things. 
The reason you're doing that is you're trying to preserve content. Now, I'm, I know maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, but uh, I'm sure we can create a, a vote or something and, pre, and preserve that content. Well, that's not the case, right? For most instances, and if you need proof, you can Google up so-called, I don't know if people have heard of the Timbuktu manuscripts. Anybody heard of the Timbuktu manuscripts? No? No. No. Okay, these are, these are like uh, manuscripts that are uh, somewhere in money or something. Uh, and these, people are not really serious about digitizing these manuscripts. When ICO came on the scene because of their belief system, uh, they, were, they started uh, destruction. They started destroying these things. And a lot of useful information was lost, right? It was lost because, I mean, no explicit decision or thought was put into how we could preserve this thing beyond the now. Uh, and this, this idea of preservation is really interesting, right? I don't know if uh, you as colleagues think about these things, but I always like to link this to um, my culture. I come from a culture, I'm told I'm chair, I, I have no idea what that means because I was raised in a very, uh, very strange way here. I know nothing about my culture. The stuff I know about my culture is things I read in books. That culture has largely been passed through from generation to generation through the word of mouth. Increasingly, as that information is being transmitted from word to mouth, the information is lost in translation, right? And very, very soon, if you, in my, I mean, my generation, well, I'll speak for myself, my, Myself and my siblings, I think it's safe to say that we are not really interested in the culture. It's dying away with us, right? It's dying away with us and the generations that are coming after us will know nothing about my culture because no explicit thought has been put into how best we can preserve this. But forget about my culture. Timbuktu manuscripts, gone, right? Digital preservation, right? So digital libraries, motivation, massive amounts of information being generated. And also, uh, the idea behind preserving content that uh, is increasingly being generated, content that is not current in digital form. And in fact, even content that is in digital form, this whole idea of digital preservation um, involves so many different aspects, right? Uh, there are things that you have to carefully think about, like the specific formats you're going to use to preserve this content. Like for instance, when you want to preserve electronic documents, they prescribe or recommend highly that you use a certain PDF standard. It's called PDF-A. It's an archival format for PDFs. There's a reason for that. Turns out that careful thought has been given to this thing you're calling PDF-A. You should look it up, um, right? It's an ISO standard. So, so preservation transcends both uh, this idea behind bond digital content and digitized content, right? That's the motivation. Uh, if you want to have an idea behind how much content we've been generating, if you look at the, an area that we are familiar with, just Google up average publications, publications in a year or something. We're generating millions of them, right? And I hope I can find this. Uh, uh, number of publications per year. I hope I'll be able to find some content. Boom, and I don't know if we can rely on the first link here. But if we're generating this much content, right, in the millions, we need to carefully think about how we're going to preserve what we're generating. Now forget about the millions we're talking about. If you look at an institution like UNSA, or if we give an example of an institution where one of us works, uh, Lev Mwenawasi University, those faculty staff every year will be generating publications. The students that we, we enroll at that university will be generating uh, publications. A hundred years from now, people might need to or might want to have access to the things that we were producing in 2020. So you need to carefully think about preserving the content, right? So motivation around digital libraries, digital library management systems, data preservation. Uh, and really, if you want to look at this from the perspective of why it's important to preserve data, you might want to look up uh, the burning of the Library of Alexandria 
right, which is one of the most um, famous libraries back in the day, right? Uh, a lot of people around the world would visit that place just so they could read books that were archived in the library. But it got bent down. Now there are conflicting stories about who bent it down and why it was bent down, but fundamentally, because there was no careful thought given to how this would be preserved, how data would be preserved, that vast amount of information got lost, right? Uh, examples closer to home, uh, I don't know if people remember, but some really iconic museum in Brazil got burned down, right? And a lot of information was lost, right? Motivation for digital preservation. Uh, again, more recently in France, I don't know if people remember this, um, information was lost, right? Uh, uh, there was a fire in Paris. I don't know if people have been keeping track of this. I mean, we're in this profession. I do hope we, <laughs> we know about these things, but it doesn't matter. The key thing here is you want to carefully think about how you're preserving data, right? Digital libraries. And again, notice that we are loosely using this word digital libraries, right? It could be anything. The key thing you soon notice is centered around long-term preservation of data. <clears throat> that data could be anything. It could be text. It could be images. It could be sound. It could be a combination of all these different things. It could be a combination of sound and images in which you come up with video. So you might be interested in preserving video. Right? Key thing is you need to carefully think about how you're going to preserve that data. And this is where digital library is coming to play. Uh, if you have done like a, a computer, uh, uh, is it an introduction to computers one or a computers introduction to computers 101 course, then you might have, or you, might, you, should, you should remember that there are, Broadly speaking, they're just, uh, is it three or four types of data? Text, sound, images. Everything else is derived from those, those different components, right? So d video can be derived from sound and images, for instance. <clears throat> but as besides the point, um, I digress. Oh. Uh, hello? Uh, hello. Uh, hi. Sorry, I'm in a class. Could you call back later? Uh, sorry, sorry about that. I so I answered that call by the way because I thought it was one of you. Maybe the class rep. It was an unknown number. So instead of checking here first, I answered the call. Uh, just usually when I get a call, it's the class rep saying, we lost you there. Uh, I'm gonna pause here, sorry for the interruption, but am I making a bit of sense here, motivation and all these things? Okay, I don't know what to make out of this silence. Yes, you're making sense, Doc. Okay. Thank you so much, great. Um, also, I know that normally, by the way, Dr. Kandria normally schedules uh, those presentations where uh, in 5010 you're working through those projects. I don't know if he's mentioned this. Those projects are not set in stone. If you're interested in working in this area, right, <clears throat> uh, you can easily change your project and carve it in such a way that you work in this particular area. And you will soon discover, by the way, that this area of cutting digital libraries, it transcends so many areas, right? Uh, you'll soon see very soon when I talk about some of the things we've been doing with the wonderful students I work with, that there's some people that are interested in metadata, for instance, and all these crazy things, right? You can look at digital libraries from a user perspective, you can look at digital libraries from a technological perspective, you know, so, uh, this is an interesting area in, in, my, in my opinion. This is what everybody will tell you. The people that are obsessed with records management will probably tell you that records management is interesting, right? Um, I don't know what's interesting. This is interesting to me. Okay, so sorry for the breaking transmission. Uh, so this last slide here on digital preservation was really linked to what, uh, the agents of preserving data as pertains to Zambia, right? Uh, so UNESCO does a lot of funding, by the way, 
funding that's linked to cultural heritage preservation. And, and recently there was, um, it's quite disappointing in our country really. There was this debate where, and I, I do hope one of you was on the other side of the fence here saying, why is Unza introducing that witchcraft degree? The, the really, it's quite shocking how, uh, how misinformed people can be, how ignorant people can be. And sometimes it's okay to be ignorant, right? The, the idea to think about here as we're discussing this, and as we're looking at these examples of cultural heritage preservation is, think about what we could preserve as a country, right? Projects, uh, deliberate programs that we can initiate so that we do these things on our own. We shouldn't wait for an individual from out there, probably a white man or something, maybe a white woman these days, to tell us to say, your Gule Wamkuru dance is extremely important and so you should preserve it. Because we think it's very important, we are willing to give you money so that you preserve this thing because you yourselves do not see the value of preserving this, we will give you money, here's the money, preserve this. <laughs> if you don't have the expertise, we will hire people that will help you preserve this. We can do better, right? Uh, this is all linked to cultural heritage, this is all linked to uh, data preservation, right, or digital preservation, right, uh, things that are somewhat closer to, to home, but we could sit here and uh, spend, um, spend all day talking about data preservation. We are not talking about data preservation, we're just setting the stage for why we need digital libraries, right. Okay, um, so I thought now would be a good time for us to just uh, briefly define these things. Uh, most of these are going to be textbook uh, uh, definitions, uh, but we've got into a stage where we can actually come up with different variations of these definitions. If you understand the importance or the key things, aspects associated with digital libraries, you should really be able to, you should be able to uh, easily, uh, easily define these things if you're looking at uh, textbook definition. So, Going forward, when we make reference to a digital library, what we are essentially making reference to is nothing more than a collection of digital objects, right? And this is like a, an organized or a well-structured collection of digital objects. And we'll soon discover, or we'll soon define or explain what a digital object is, uh, but we can loosely think of it as being this uh, artifact that is in electronic form, the artifact that would be interested in preserving. So it could be an image, it could be a PDF document, it could be a video, it could be a sound recording. And the thing we are calling a digital library would fundamentally be uh, composed of things uh, or aspects we are calling services. These services will allow us to gain access to these things that we are interested in organizing in this collection. So you have this well-structured collection of digital objects. You need a way to be able to access the structured digital objects. So you need services. And the services essentially will facilitate certain key aspects associated with this digital library. In a nutshell, if you look at the broad, there's an unlimited number of services that you could come up with. But in a nutshell, the services could be broken up into services that would enable you to access the digital objects. So if you, you have images in a collection, one of the things you might want to do is to be able to access the, the images. You want to store the images so that they are preserved over a long period of time. You might be interested in managing the images, manipulating them in a certain way, right? maybe updating that, that, that content so that it, it is replaced with um, an up-to-date version of the content. Maybe add uh, additional auxiliary metadata elements to the object. So that is all manipulation or management. And fundamentally, the services that are linked to a digital library can be dumbed down to access, storage, and management. Uh, another key aspect of this digital library is Fundamentally, one of the reasons why you have this digital library is at, at some point in the future, you will have a broad range of users that will want to interact with the digital library using the services. Now, the interaction would be based on what that particular user is interested in doing. 
for people in our profession, one of the things you'd be doing is managing the digital object. So you'd be interested in services that facilitate management of digital objects. For end users out there that are accessing the public interface of the digital library, they'd be interested in accessing the digital object, right? Uh, some services are obscured, right? You, they are behind the scenes services, but as you are putting that object into the digital library for the first time, there are services that facilitate that storage or long-term preservation of the digital object, right? Uh, so, wide range of users. Uh, it turns out that another way of looking at this digital library is from the perspective of it being an interconnection of really uh, networked, storage-based, computer-based information system. Again, if you think about this, if you pause for a little while and think about these definitions I'm talking about here, you'll notice that all of these things we've spoken about are linked to those five key aspects associated with information systems or computer-based information systems. Procedures, people, hardware, software, data sources. You will need a data source that you're going to use to store these digital objects into, especially metadata in this case. <clears throat> people are involved in here because they'll need to access this digital library at some point in time. You need processes and procedures because you need to specify exactly how people are going to be accessing the digital uh, objects that you're putting in this digital library, right? You need hardware because if this thing is computer-based, it needs to be set up, sorry, it needs to be set up on a piece of hardware, a computer. You need software because for you to set up this collection, you will need a specific type of software. You will also need prerequisite software components that will need that will be required to support the piece of software you're going to use to set up these collections. So if you use this space, what you soon discover is this space requires a number of prerequisite components. A number of prerequisite components. So sorry about that. I, I have my phone on on standby here because in the event that I lose connection, I'm expecting that the class reps will contact us or one of you will contact, will contact me. And I hope I'm making sense. I see people are leaving. We have 22 now. We had uh, slightly more. I hope I'm, and uh, Miss Maggie is yawning here. I think I'm being boring. Uh, okay. I don't know. So I don't know if that definition may make sense. This definition though is linked to, hmm, it's linked to a computer-based information system. Okay. <clears throat> But again, our formal definition, a digital, remember, we're dis describing what a digital library is, which is a collection of digital objects. But for you to be able to manage the digital objects, you will need a digital library system. Or sometimes the way a digital library management system will be used, either interchangeably or in isolation. But the digital library management system or the digital library system is the actual computer-based information system that you use to set up this collection. So with that being said, while the digital library is a collection of digital objects, a digital library system is a computer-based information system that we use to store digital objects, manage the digital objects, and facilitate easy access or effective access to the digital objects. Again, I'm linking this to these three key things that you look for in a digital library, right? Access, storage, management or manipulation. Um, another way of looking at this is from the perspective of uh, a layered, or looking at the digital library management system as being composed of these multiple layers. A layer that you use to facilitate access, user interface. A layer that you use to provide different services, service layer a layer that is responsible for storage of the digital object, storage layer. Now we'll talk, talk more about these different things called bit streams and whatnot. But right now, uh, the things that I just wanna draw attention to here is that when it comes to access, it turns out that it's not just human beings that will access things in digital library. It might turn out that other computer-based information systems out there might be interested in accessing the content. And this will soon make sense once we discuss the protocols that are used in digital library uh, management system, digital library systems. 
So there is either machine-to-machine -machine interaction, where you have another computer that accesses services here. You also have um, user interaction with it, where you have human beings that are accessing a digital library here. Right, so a human being could be one of you colleagues, for instance, so it could be light on accessing a digital library. Machine to machine interaction, um, I'll give an example very, very soon, uh, but it could be um, uh, another portal out there like uh, OATD. OATD.org. What OATD.org does is behind the scenes, this machine to machine interaction, this the server that has this application makes it possible for this application to access our University of Zambia repository. Now there's no human being involved here. This is completely machine to machine interaction. Right? And so uh, every I don't know if it's every day, content is pulled from the invest of Zambia, right? Not invest of Zimbabwe, I said invest of Zambia. Ooh. Oh, there we go. So you notice here, I don't know if you can see my screen here, but you will notice that, uh, you'll notice that uh, this will take you to the Invest of Zambia, not Invest of Zamb Zimbabwe, Invest of Zambia repository. I guess we have the Invest of Zambia because we have certain degrees that are done in collaboration with uh, partners. I know there's uh, the Open University of Zimbabwe or something, which does, where a number of programs are, uh, offered uh, using a sandwich kind of program. But anyway, I digress. So a layer, you can, you can view a digital library system as being composed of three layers. User interface, service layer, um, and the storage layer, right? This is what we're talking about here. <coughs> now, uh, if we want us again to just, just reiterate these different layers here, we'll start with the user interface layer, like I said, uh, what this does is it facilitates access to digital objects and uh, the interaction of the access can either be by other machines or by users out there, right? The service layer will consist of different functionalities that allow you to interact with the digital objects. So you could, you could have a service that implements a certain protocol, for instance, by the way, these are all protocols, OIPMH, OpenSearch, SWORD, you could uh, throw in REST API here and whatnot. But popular services <coughs> include services that allow you to inject, in, ingest, or insert, or upload a new digital object into a digital library. The process is called ingestion, which is why you typically have an ingestion service. Um, this is a must have service, right? Whether you like it or not, at some point, once you set up the digital library, you will have to put in content or digital object into that digital library. And the way you do that is you, you, you do that by taking advantage of ingestion services. Now these ingestion services, you'll soon discover that they come in various forms. Most uh, popular digital library systems, open source tools and services will come with workflows that allow ingestion of content. There are background services that allow batch ingestion of digital objects. We'll look at all these different things. Uh, other must-have services are services that facilitate the discovery of content into the digital libraries. Think for a second here. If you have a digital library that has thousands or even millions of digital objects, you need a way to be able to easily find what you're looking for if you're an end user. If I'm an end user that is interested in content in the UNSA Institution Repository, and I don't know what I'm looking for, the first thing I, I would expect to find here is a service that will allow me to search, right? Uh, I'll search for our able, uh, kind of, our able postgraduate coordinator for Emily's program. I should be able to search for content because there are thousands of things here. I want to refine my search. Um, and once I search for Akakandela, I have these different search results that are linked to hopefully the way that Akakandela. Not only search, there are other discovery services that facilitates browsing. So you can browse for content. You go to the repository, you have no idea what you're looking for. Maybe you, you uh, at the beginning of your research, you go to the repository and you want to find the content that you're looking for. You want to be able to browse. You can browse by subject, by type of content you're looking for. All of these are services that facilitate information discovery. These are all must-have services, by the way. You, you, can, you can have 
uh, other services that are more specific to management of the digital objects, right? These are object management services, right? So if you want to modify an object that is already here. So if you notice that, oh, the word Mulenga was misspelled or the title was misspelled, you have to log in and then edit that. The editing process is part of what we're calling management of the digital object. Granted, in this case, you are managing the digital object by modifying the metadata associated with the digital object. Uh, but it turns out that there's more services that you could think of, and the services uh, could be viewed as being um, services that are linked to what you might call value-added services. Uh, value-added services are not really must-have services, but services that might be specific to the type of content that you're providing or the type of service that you might want to provide. Now, what you discover is that most digital libraries, like if you look at an example of um, an institution repository from my alma mater, which is the University of Cape Town, they have a very nifty service that allows people to look at, to look at how many times people have viewed a particular, a particular digital object. Now, if I can only find what I'm looking for here. For metadata record. I hope I'll be able to find it here. I should be able, I hope it's still there. I should be able to, oh, it's not there. That's sad. I so wish it was there. Maybe I should search for Lightning's. Uh, I was looking for a, a statistics to do with a specific object. But if you look at this service that says view usage statistics, for instance. What these people have done is they've implemented, they've integrated this value added service that allows people to be able to see, uh, to be able to see uh, statistics associated with a particular object, right? And this is weird here. This is a particular handle that I've opened actually. So this is what I was looking for. So these are statistics linked to this particular ETD. Now to try and uh, help you understand this, I'll use Lighton as an example here. It's a lot easier for me to understand because I know that one of my documents has been here for more than two years here. So if I'm Lighton and I'm obsessed with statistics and I want to see how many people have been looking up my doctoral thesis, for instance, I'll log into the institutional repository and access a value added service that allows me to see where, how many people have, have been accessing this content. This is just the month, the year 20, I guess the uh, 2020 broken down by month, right? This is a value added service that uh, shows me where most of these views are coming from. It's reassuring that some people, some views are coming from Zambia. Thank you, Zambia. Uh, but the key thing here is that this is a value added service, right? <clears throat> it's, it's not a must have, but it's a service that you might integrate with your digital library system, depending on whether you think your potential end users would find it useful. All right, on with it. I hope that can make sense. Um, uh, and it turns out that specifics of these uh, services here, like the must have services, like congestion services, uh, would be linked to things like uh, workflows, like I said, or batch ingestion, right? Um, an example of how your typical. And that's right, you are breaking. Oh, I'm breaking. I'll pause for it for a Am I still breaking? Should I change? I wonder if I should change my connection. I'm still breaking. Am I breaking for everybody, or maybe it's just uh, ooh, it's just for? Okay, you're breaking. We can't hear you clearly. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to switch my connection. Uh, I'll switch my connection. <clears throat> We can't hear anything. Uh, hi, how is my connection now? Hello, how is my connection now? I can hear you clearly. I don't know about others. Okay. Uh, I can hear so, you. All right. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I just want to swap my connection. So we're, we're just talking through. We were just walking through uh, some sample services, some sample services specific to these things we are calling must-have services, really. 
Again, we can spend the whole day talking about these different services, but we're just going to um, uh, focus on things that we will look at during the so-called practical walkthrough, maybe just screenshots here. Uh, so in terms of ingestion, you might have workflows that will allow you to ingest a digital object. So if you're adding a digital object for the first time, these popular digital library systems will have a workflow type of service that allows you to go through various stages where you upload the bitstream or the PDF document, if it's a document, you specify the metadata associated with that document. You specify copyright information that is called a workflow and it's part of the ingestion service. There's also batch ingestion, right? So if you're interested in uploading numerous digital objects at any given point in time, if you don't want to do it one object at a time, you can batch ingest them. These are all separate services. <clears throat> uh, popular services associated with information discovery are the obvious uh, browsing and searching, right? So, what the screenshot is showing you is your typical browse services associated with uh, one of the most widely used digital library open source software, which is DSpace. You typically have um, a browse feature that allows you to browse by uh, a title, by subject, by author. And so when you click on A, then in this case, you'll be browsing subjects that would begin with an A, right? Um, you can also browse by by date, you can browse by author, you know, you can, you can, you can actually uh, undergo what they call faceted browsing. There's a feature associated with faceted browsing where when you browse by author, you can facet that specific authors you're interested in by the subject or by the title. These are all very useful features to have when you're accessing content in a digital library that has thousands or even millions of digital objects. Forget, forget the UNSA repository, which has just 5,000 objects. Think of a platform like, um, oh, I don't know now. Oh, the SEM. <clears throat> SEM Digital Library. You want to let them be able to effect and to easily book things not coming up, right? Classic example here. And I wonder if I can go. Uh, there's various ways of browsing. You can search. You can browse by uh, so-called uh, subject classification schemes, right? Search by subjects. So this is browsing. Uh, and this is useful, right? Because a person like Lighton, for instance, is perhaps not interested in network and communication. Maybe I'm just interested in information systems. And I hope this library is here, digital. Libraries. Digital libraries is a, a considered a class of, it's considered a, a type of subcategory here. And uh, I'm going to pause for a little while here. There's a, there's a, um, I'm going to pause for a little while because I, I'm always on the lookout for what's happening in the WhatsApp group, although I've never quite uh, been obsessed with WhatsApp, but I think I see some unread messages in the mass group, I don't know if these were old messages or, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, oh, this is, okay. I, I hope we let uh, Connie in. I hope this is from 18, okay. Open. <clears throat> right, so I was, I was looking at an example of um, uh, a so-called service. In this case, it's a digital library that has millions of, of uh, objects, right? For me to be able to easily find what I'm looking for, let's say I'm looking for content to do with digital libraries. I know that digital libraries are associated with uh, society and computing, I think, I, I could be mistaken here, uh, digital libraries. And I could find that, no. Okay, uh, but anyway, I could easily browse for uh, a particular classification scheme, right? Uh, and in this case, I think the interface has changed drastically here. Uh, or perhaps it's the stuff that I'm looking for, which is why I can't. Anyway. Okay, that's fine. Uh, it appears this thing is not very, I was trying to find uh, 
a subfield linked to digital libraries anyway, but it appears the scene is not there, but that's fine. It's okay. Key takeaway point here is uh, observe the statistics I was talking about. The ACM digital library archives content published since 1936 all the way up to now. The current number of publications is 2,834,004 publications. This number changes almost every day, right? So this gives you an idea. And also, something else to look out for is the number of people that are downloading content from this digital library, which by the way, this library system, which by the way, is a computer-based information system. Downloads per week, per, I thought we had down, uh, daily downloads here. Anyway, cumulative downloads, 291 million, right, plus. Downloads in the last 12 months, 31 million. Downloads uh, in the past six weeks, six million. So a uh, key takeaway point here is uh, when you have a digital library that has millions of records, you want to make sure that you have discovery services that make it possible or that make it a lot easier for end users to be able to find what they are looking for, right? I hope that kind of makes sense. Searching and browsing is a classic way of, um, of uh, facilitating easy access to content. So browsing, searching, and searching is pretty easy really. Typically most of these so-called digital library systems will be integrated with an external service which is called an information retrieval system. And uh, so you will soon discover once we have a discussion of so called information is integrated with an external service called Apache Solar, right? Apache Solar is what makes it possible for people to be able to type search phrases in this space, in here. When I type in a search phrase and I get results here, let's say I say digital libraries, Apache Solar makes it possible for me to be able to see these matches that I have here, right? Because there's indexing that is done when you ingest content into the repository, okay? Um, uh, <clears throat> right, so we will have a, a discussion, a thorough discussion of uh, how index, indexing plays a very vital role in so far as browsing and searching is concerned. Uh, but fundamentally, a key takeaway point is that these discovery services uh, typically take the form of searching and browsing. This is a given. A, any typical digital library platform that you, digital library system or management system that you come across, will have a search feature, a browse feature. All those features are collectively referred to as discovery services. Uh, but the additional uh, services, like I say, depending on what sort of service you're providing, depending on what sort of information or data you're wanting to preserve, whether it's an image, whether it's text, there are annotation services, visualization services, right? Um, the, the statistics that I was showcasing, that could be viewed as being a visualization type of service. Uh, some services will only be accessible by administrators, so if, if the institutional repository management from the University of Zambia uh, will have time, you will soon see that uh, he's able to generate statistics that showcase where people are accessing content in the UNSA library, I mean the UNSA repository, which countries they're coming from, which period this content is being accessed, right? Uh, and you ask, well, what's, why is that important? Well, this links on to the idea behind information systems, which was introduced by Dr. Peary, right, Dr. Jackson Peary, where we mentioned that there are certain information systems that are used for decision making. If you go to middle to upper management and you tell them, oh, we seem to have a lot of people from Japan that are accessing our content, maybe it's uh, content to do with uh, vet medicine, then the university will put in place deliberate measures to reach out to universities in Japan and find out if they're interested in collaborating with our school of veterinary medicine. Right, so different things uh, or different auxiliary services depending on the needs. Uh, in terms of the storage sublayer, like I said, the idea here is to facilitate long-term preservation of digital objects, right? This is the sole purpose of the storage layer. Its role is to facilitate that storage and long-term preservation of the digital object, the thing that you ingest into this digital library. Right. And the best way to look at how this is achieved is to, to really break apart this digital object and view it from the perspective of the different subcomponents that it's composed of. 
right? Uh, so your typical digital object, the thing we are calling a digital object is essentially composed of what we call a bit stream and metadata, right? So your bit stream will be the actual content that you are interested in consuming as an end user. So think of this from a uh, perspective of what sort of content you are putting into a digital library. It could be an image, it could be a PDF document, it could be a video, it could be a sound recording. That would be a bit stream, it's actual content. The metadata is uh, descriptive information or information about the content that will help provide context about that content. In most instances, the information that provides context information is referred to as descriptive metadata, right? Uh, so if we were to visualize this thing we are calling a digital object really, this is how it would logically look, look like, right? Uh, so it's composed of um, bitstream, uh, which is the actual content here. Um, you have metadata by way of like uh, details to do with transaction logs and the signature here. Um, and then also something else will, which will come up very, very soon is a unique identifier. So it means by which you can easily identify each of the millions or thousands of digital objects that you have in a digital library. So if we, we are accessing content from, from here, well, we've discovered that we have 2 million, or rather, yeah, 2.8 million digital objects. We need a way to uniquely, to uniquely, to uniquely identify each of these 2 million digital objects. So you need, you need a unique identifier, right? Uh, and you soon discover that this unique identifier uh, is usually represented using things called, uh, well, these unique identifiers come in different forms, but things like handles or digital object identifiers or DOIs. I'm sure you've come across this as you are doing a literature review. Oh, your DO, the DOI is this, right? That's a unique identifier. This thing is the one that sets apart this particular digital object from the others. Okay. Um, <clears throat> right, so fundamentally, by, by setting it apart, what you're effectively doing is providing local and global uniqueness for that particular digital object. So using that identifier, you can set each one of those digital objects apart from the other digital objects within that collection and from the perspective of the internet, if this is an internet, if it's an internet-based um, application or service, as is the case for the UNSA institution repository, right? The content in there can be accessed by anyone in the world. So we need a way to be able to uniquely identify content coming in from the UNSA institution repository. That is done by um, unique identifier. Uh, so metadata, nothing more than providing information about information. And in fact, the class, classic textbook definition of metadata is data about data, right? It's nothing more than auxiliary information that provides additional context. Again, one of the upcoming lecture series, uh, I think it's next, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, we look at metadata in great depth. We get to look at the difference between structural metadata, descriptive metadata, and administrative metadata, and the role that these things play. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know if, that, if this is making sense. I don't know, okay. Uh, hello. Yes, hi. Um, I, I wanted to, to know if it is present. I've seen, I've seen so, platform. Sorry. Oh, sorry, could you, could you repeat the question? I think you're breaking up there. Sorry, could you repeat your question? Okay, I was, I was trying to, to Okay. I was, try, I was trying to find out if uh, a digital library is the same thing as an institutional repository. I don't know if you're able to hear me now. Yes, I can. Great question. And that question comes very, very soon. It turns out that this, remember, I, I, when, I, when we were talking about uh, CMSs in the introduction, I introduced this whole notion of content management systems, right? 
And I mentioned that uh, digital library management systems are a type of content management system. It turns out that these things are called digital libraries can be used in different contexts. And these digital library management systems or digital library systems come in different flavors. So there are digital library systems that are specific for implementing institutional repository. The simple answer to your really nice question is that institutional repositories are a subset of digital libraries. They're just a type of digital libraries. Effectively, you're implicitly signaling the type of data or content that you're interested in archiving. So you could view like a, a cultural heritage collection as being a type of a digital library. And I don't know if I have this screenshot, but a wonderful project that I worked on when I was a graduate student myself is the Bleak and Lloyd collection. I love this, right? Bleak and Lloyd. Bleak and Lloyd collection. So the University of Cape Town has come up with this cultural heritage collection that uh, archives pictures, right? Rock art paintings that were uh, inscribed by the so called Sun people many, many years ago, right? Uh, and there are researchers that are seriously using this cultural heritage collection to conduct research, right? And you're probably asking there, why would people int be interested in rock art, art paintings and the cultures of the sun? Well, people have discovered that there, there are certain approaches to health that were used by these people that might prove to be useful during our time, right? So anyway, that's your question. An institutional repository is just a subset of a digital library. So it's, 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 it's a, an application, it's a digital library system that is applied in a particular domain. In this case, it would be like in the uh, higher education domain or something, or entities, organizations that are interested in archiving research output, institutional repository. I hope that makes sense. Um, maybe not, I don't know. Okay. Uh, so on with it. So an example of metadata here, nothing more than descriptive information. And if I got this uh, screenshot is showing you is just descriptive information here, right? Uh, advisor, author, the date when this object was ingested into the repository, the date when it was made available, the date when it was submitted by the author in 2018, uh, how it should be cited, the identifier, uh, abstract, this is all descriptive information. But in terms of the bitstream here, the content itself, like I said, it's actual content that people will be consuming. And if we were to use an example of an institutional repository, it would be the actual PDF, right? This would be this thing here. Uh, not only that, the actual thing that you would be interested in viewing, you know, open up that PDF. PDF that you open is the bitstream itself. Uh, and, and usually this is the sort of content that uh, people would be interested in, right? Okay. Um, I don't know if there are any questions with regards to what we just talked about. Before we look at some application domains, and then we'll wrap up this particular part of this library. I'll pause for a little while and wait to see if there are I have a question, Doc. Yes, please. Yes, I think I missed something. My phone went off due to lack of power. On batch okay. injection. Yes. Does it only apply to content like text form or it only applies to objects? It's actually, it's, it's actually, it's all the different types of So if you set up a digital library that is meant to, to let's say house um, images, for instance, you can gain access to a batch ingestion process, right? And maybe we should do this as an example in the walkthrough. I will showcase exactly how one of the most widely used uh, digital library system if this implements batch ingestion, right? So you use the console to just uh, organize, let's say, 100 objects. Then you, you upload them at once. Instead of you going through that very painful five-step, or is it maybe six-step process in this space, the work for itself, one item at a time, right? So it applies to all the different types of objects. I don't know if that helps Okay. Yes, I, I get it. I was okay. thinking it all applies to objects like pictures and not text like maybe names. No, it's actually everything. And in fact, the way you, so this is what they call, um, when you're back ingesting, that's what they call a simple archive format. Uh, so 
so using the simple archive format, what you do is you you prepare you prepare the the things you want to ingest. Let's say you have a hundred things you want to ingest. You prepare them in such a way that they're organized so that if it's PDFs, all the hundred PDFs have the descriptive metadata associated with each of the digital objects. Because when you're ingesting content into the repository, what you need to specify is the content and the metadata. When you're doing batch ingestion, you prepare the metadata beforehand. So you put this text. This is text, right? You put it in a file and you're using a standard format. You put you, you organize it alongside the actual bit stream that you want to upload, and then you run the service that facilitates batch ingestion. And then all the hundred items will be ingested at, at, at one point. You, you the implicit time really. I yeah. hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, indeed. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so we're just going to wrap up by looking at some example application domains here. This is by no means comprehensive, but these are maybe some things that most of you can easily relate to. Uh, some domains that perhaps are applicable to your workplaces here, yeah? right? Um, it turns out really that uh, some, some of the widely used domains here or the, the ways in which uh, digital library systems or digital libraries are applied is in the cultural heritage sector where people are increasingly setting up these cultural heritage collections. Um, I have no idea if Zambia has any such cultural heritage collections, but if you, had the, if you have the chance to travel in other countries like South Africa, for instance, and other so-called developed countries or other progressive countries, if you visit a typical museum, you will typically have heritage collections that you can access in digital form, right? So those heritage collections are composed of digitized images of maybe it could be a culture of the people, right? So if you go to Lusaka Museum, uh, what I'm referring to is you'd be, you would have access to something like uh, a digital archive that you can play back, an archive specific to the Lozi, right? Depicting the culture of the Lozi. Not something static, but something that's in digital form. And you do, you do that by creating a digital, uh, a cultural heritage collection, right? So. Uh, cultural preservation or cultural heritage. Uh, a lot of most higher learning institutions would want to showcase the type of research that they generate. And this is where institution repositories come into play, right? That question. Um, there are a slew of academic data based examples of digital libraries, right? There are also other unconventional domains and walk through these in succession just so people can um, can understand, I guess, how these things are used these days, right? But again, um, in terms of examples here, uh, we just try to set the stage here just to mention that the number of entities out there, I mean, it's not the case for Zambia, but the number of countries and organizations out there that are increasingly creating digital uh, heritage collections that depict cultures, for instance, uh, of certain people, right? And the idea behind this is you're trying to preserve the culture. Uh, it's not Z Zambia that's afflicted by this. If you go out there and uh, try and do a mapping of how many people were able to speak solely 50 years ago and now, <laughs> you notice that that number is dwindling. The same goes for my language, which is Chewa. The number of people that used to speak classic Chewa, the actual Chewa, 50 years from now, where so many in comparison to now, when I sit and I'm talking to my now, very old and frail grandmother to speak that I can, I can understand, well, for the most part, but I don't know how to speak culture. One of the things I would do is go, it could be by way of recording sound, right? And then I would create a cultural heritage collection with sound of how that language is supposed to be spoken, for instance. Right? Maybe to latch on the Gwewamkul, perhaps I want to document the culture, the Gwewamkul culture, so that 100 years from now, 500 years from now, In the event that this culture fizzles out, as is always the case with 
the human cultures. The people preserving it is by creating cultural heritage collections. Um, so some classic examples, the Google has set up this really grand, um, grand initiative where they're preserving different cultures from around the world. I do encourage you to go here. Uh, specific traditional ceremonies in, in Africa, right? Uh, people cultures or cultures um, of peoples in various parts of the world, like Asia, for instance, or South America. So uh, examples of cultural heritage preservation here. This platform is a classic example. Digital library. I always like this mapping here to showcase how behind we are as a continent, as a, as a country. When we were getting this screenshot, we had nothing in Zambia that was appearing here. Right? It's not that hard, I guess. All we need is a deliberate plan from the people that are responsible for preserving. Uh, anyone responsible for preserving culture in Zambia? Which entity? No, I don't know. Does anyone work for an entity that preserves culture in Zambia? Anyone, any takers? I'm gonna pause here, I'm wondering if maybe my collection has, okay, perhaps not. I don't know if people are quiet here. Uh, maybe there's no one, right, who, <laughs> who is preserving our culture, which is why nothing has been preserved. I don't know, right? I'll be surprised. Maybe the Minister of Tourism, right? If you thought about that, maybe it could be, I don't know. Uh, it could be maybe the entities that are responsible for, who act as custodians for um, keeping records that we generate as a country, right? Any, anyone who is responsible for that in, the, in this room here? No? Okay, uh, it's it's quite um, <laughs> it's unfortunate. This is a um, uh, this is a classic, I guess, case of waiting for someone else to preserve uh, preserve something for you because nobody knows who's doing what or something. But I, I, there, there's bound to be an entity that is responsible for cultural preservation. It, it could be maybe a unit or a department within uh, Minister of Tourism or something. But, but this, this, this speaks volumes, right? It, it, it shows that, uh, if you look at what's happening, Right, so we, we, we feel like um, we feel like uh, preservation of of culture has become, or preservation of culture is something that's not very important. I don't know. That's, that's always that's my thinking anyway. Oh, there's no sound. Is that for everyone? Val, it says there's no sound. Can can you hear me? Can can you hear me or can you not hear me? Someone is complaining about sound. I can hear you. Okay, breaking. So I'm, I'm breaking again. I'm sorry about that. Am I still breaking? Should I change my connection? Yeah, no, okay. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> right, so I was talking about culture here. And this, these are conversations we should be having, right? But, but maybe people are not really interested in this sort of conversation. <laughs> I don't know how you're passing down the knowledge you've acquired because very, very soon, just like light on, you. You will not be around, you will die, or we're passing down the, the heritage, right? The culture. And I know these days you have smartphones and you're taking photos of your trip to the village, maybe you're recording this thing, but how are you preserving them, right? Something to think about. But anyway, uh, we don't know who's custodian of our culture. Very sad. Um, great. So there's, there's a couple of other examples. Um, I'll ask that maybe we mute our microphones. I think there's someone who has the microphone on. Uh, I worked on this really interesting project. I mentioned the digital Blick and Lloyd collection, right? Um, 
it's a classic and most people that uh, work as students in the digital libraries research group at the University of Cape Town we interact with this collection it's a classic it has its own Wikipedia page um, there are a number of people that are interested in the digital brick and Lloyd collection I do encourage you to look at this uh, a while back I was um, I worked on a project um, that was overseen by the Center for Curating the Archive at the University of Cape Town and my task was to set up these really nice collections for classics I do encourage you to visit this um, but but for me this and, and for me these experiences that I've had really have have sort of like changed my value system I've gotten to a stage where I and I know this when I talk to my to my friends about these things to my colleagues they look at me strange when I say I'm interested in cultural heritage preservation they think that I'm mad right but it's I guess I've been molded in a certain way because of my experiences because I've seen the value the importance of preserving culture. When you go out there and you meet other people, they'll ask questions about your culture. And alas, I had very little to talk about. Um, so, which reminds me, um, maybe there's something we can do to preserve some of this culture. Now, forget about this, oh no, the witchcraft degree. That's just a joke, right? But something to think about. Beyond institutional repositories, we could easily think about how best we can uh, preserve some of these cultures. Right? Maybe all of those people that are interested in cultural heritage preservation, we could look into how we could effectively preserve um, some of this heritage that we have, rich heritage, right? Anyway, um, an example that perhaps most of us are interested in on application domain is so-called institutional repositories. Uh, the motivation here is that a number of higher education institutions will typically generate scholarly research output or publications, um, and so institutional repositories are used to showcase this research output. Um, <clears throat> and and these, these repositories really will take different shapes and forms. So some universities will come up with separate repositories that are used as thesis and dissertation portals. Good evening. Uh, hi. Yeah. I've got a question, Doc. Sorry for interrupting you. Just uh, no, no, it's uh, fine. Ten seconds. Interruptions are actually good. Yes. Yes. Um, with uh, the coming of uh, these uh, digital libraries, uh, what is the future or prospects of librarianship? What, what do you mean? What's the future prospect of librarianship? Uh, yeah, 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 the professional. Uh, how Uh, what relevance is there in I don't us? Yes, yes, there's a lot of relevance. I mean, if you look at, oh, I see what you mean. I mean, if you look at, ah, oh, I see what you mean. It's, listen, the, what's happening here, right? You could look at what's happening as being automation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and really, when, when you automate certain processes and procedures, um, there are a couple of things that can happen, right? It's either some roles will become relevant, irrelevant, right, or redundant, um, in which case they're replaced, obviously, by the automation. But in more, more instances need to be done. And, and in fact, if you ask people like Zachary, for instance, he'll tell you that they have noticed a drastic reduction in the people that visit the special collection. The thing is, who is going to manage the portal that you've set up? Who is going to manage those things that you're setting up? It's the same librarians, right? So the future is bright. Um, the, the issue here is to just evolve with time, right? You have to change with time. And, and really this, this, this evolution transcends domains. Uh, it's not just uh, librarians, it's lecturers. Uh, we've had to evolve during this COVID-19. There were people that were previously struggling to use Moodle, for instance, and I know this is a trivial example, but you have to evolve. It's evolve or die. So the future is bright, if you ask me. And, and really, if you, if you look at the landscape of what other people are doing out there, 
Oh, Adrian says I'm breaking again. Uh, I'm going to ask you, is that the case for everyone? Am I breaking for everyone? Uh, no, am I, I can breaking for get everyone? you properly. Oh, so Adrian, mm. you can check your connection. Oh, okay. Uh, if I'm breaking, then I'll, okay, I'm breaking. Let me just do this. I'll switch to my other connection. Just give me a second, boy, a few seconds. Uh, hello, how, how is this? Sorry for the breaking transmission. You are clear. Okay, thanks. All right, so we're almost done, by the way, in case I see people are tired. I, I think Jacqueline is, I don't know if she's dozing there. And uh, Matilda seems bored now, and Adrian is, uh, I, know, I don't know if I forced you to be at work here. I think he's still at work, I see the whiteboard here. Um, Maggie looks cold here, but I hope uh, that we're almost done with this thing. Uh, <laughs> I hope I'm making sense. That's a key thing here. Help consolidate some of the things you've been reading as you're going through the modules. But anyway, so the future. Pardon, Doc. Pardon. Yes. Yes, uh, yeah. Um, unfortunately, there was a, a break the time we were trying to explain. Okay. Especially yeah, in the so, middle of the statement. Yeah. yeah right, right. So, so I was saying the future is bright. Um, the only thing to think about here is how best we can evolve. I'll give you an example here. If you wait for Monday, what, what Bumba will do is she'll walk us through what they've done at Zika's to set up the institutional repository. And one of the things that I hope she'll talk about is the realization they've made that they need additional resource in the library mm -hmm. because of what they've done, right? So depending on the type of automation you actually embark upon, some roles will become redundant, but also, on the upside, you are creating additional, additional processes and procedures that would have to be performed by human beings, right? So I, I think, I, I think as far as librarianship is concerned, I think the future is bright. Um, I think that this is an opportunity to actually get to showcase to the outside world uh, how relevant we are, right? Uh, they usually weird, uh, weird decisions that are made, right? When like there was something in the media, I don't know if people came across this. There's a, weird, there's a video circulating about uh, a least graduate, right? So someone who graduated with a least and a PA major, right? Double major, four years ago, and uh, he sells chat or something. But that's just the point. Anyway. The, the thing is, the misconception people have is if you look at the comments, oh, no, this, pro this program should be abolished. People don't realize that the program itself, now, even though I'm not heavily involved with the program, I understand why it's there. People forget that the people that will eventually manage the records that you have in these organizations will have to do that program. There's no organization that exists that doesn't have a unit that is responsible for records management. Right? Um, you know, libraries are still relevant as far as higher education institutions are concerned. Uh, and maybe the comments that are coming in from people uh, from the perspective of them thinking in as much as we had libraries 20 years ago, I remember there was a library in Chipata, I grew up in Chipata, but these days I think very few people are visiting that library, right? So all those different things uh, that people that are not well informed or, or sort of like uh, bring out. But I think the, the future is bright. The key thing here is you want to evolve with time. And if I were you, if you are thinking of evolving with time, what better way than carving out a research project, that one year plus research project that you're going to do, that will force you to evolve with time. If you look at what other people are doing, they're they are going beyond what we're going to cover in this course and these other courses, insofar as evolving with time is concerned, right? They're doing a lot of interesting things, right? Taking advantage of technology. So I think the future is bright, in my opinion. Um, uh, so in closing, again, still latching onto your question here. Everything is changing. It's not just librarianship. Teaching is changing, right? One of the things I teach is, um, I guess, data mining, which has some component of artificial intelligence, right? And I normally use an example of, um, of um, say, I mean, if you look at robotics, for instance, people will tell you very, very soon we'll have robots as teachers, 
A question to ask is, if, if let's say a couple of years from now you have a robot teaching, does that mean that teachers will become redundant? Well, maybe their roles will change, but I don't think that they'll become re redundant. I don't think we've gotten to a stage where you completely do away with the teacher, where you completely do away with the librarian, for instance, or a records manager, right? If you are one of those who works in an environment away from a classic li librarianship here, but if you're one of those who handles records, right? A similar argument could be made to say, increasingly more and more people are interested in, in implementing electronic records management. Does that mean that my role as a records manager is going to be obsolete? I don't think so. You still need it, right? Uh, because part of what you're doing with, with the platform that implements that records management cycle is a person that understands that cycle, right? The person that is able to verify the things that the system is doing. I, I hope that uh, answers the question. But these are interesting questions that perhaps we should raise also on uh, Monday when a, an expert in this area, someone who's been practicing, uh, just like some of you in here, will be able to provide uh, very valuable insights. Uh, but I, I hope that actually answers your question, though. Yes. Um, I think last week or the other week, I attended um, the launch of Astria Library at uh, Protea Twin Tower. I don't know if you heard about it. No, Astria Library. Astria Digital Library, yes. I think it's Astria, yes, Astria. Oh, no. They were launched. What, what is, which, which organization is, uh, is behind this? Um... I think it's uh, the, the developers of, uh, of of the same the, the developers of the same software. So yeah, they, okay. Okay. they are launching the subscription service through the in, in, through the Ministry of Education, and they decided okay. to subsidize the subscription to about three hundred kwacha per year. Now, um, during the launch, they ran an advert, um, obviously about the product, about how people will have access to these. Um, thousands of, uh, you know, um, e-books and all. And uh, one thing that kind of disturbed me, which is closely uh, related to what um, my colleague was asking you about our relevance, was they were basically saying, um, you no longer need to go to the library. We are bringing the library to your, to your house or to where you are. So what would you say about that? I, I, I think I wasn't comfortable with um, that line in the advert. I think it was wrong. It was misrepresenting. Um, and, and I think that much as libraries are about books, they're also about the space um, and the environment. So I don't know what your comment would be. Um, well, well my, my immediate comment is uh, if you're a businessman, right, um, you, you probably hire people that are good at marketing. If you're interested in, in, in money, you want to, you always come up with catchy phrases that will attract people to you so that you make money. Now, I'm not sure what this subscription service is all about, uh, but if it's a subscription service that is similar to what we do at the UNSA, um, then uh, could you clarify if this is similar to the, you know that the UNSA has, um, the UNSA, just like most institutions of Harlem, subscribes to, um, academic databases out there, yes? Mm -hmm. Is this similar to what this uh, Astra Digital Library is all about? E-journals and e-books, is this the same? Yes. yes. Yeah, but, but this, has, this has been around for years now, right? And, and the people that perhaps, um, I don't know, I think we haven't interacted that much, but I'm trying to think of who works for Levi Mwanawasa. Uh, is, is the person around, the person who works for Levmon Asa University or something? Or I don't know if the person from um, Mbala, I can't see her, she's not there. You see, what, one, one of the things you do, right, when you're working for a higher education institution, for instance, you typically subscribe to these academic databases so that faculty staff and students can easily have access to payload materials. Now, I, I think if I was to speculate, because I have no idea about what the launch was all about, but if I was to speculate, this is what Astria is doing. So what Astria Library or whatever it is they're calling themselves are doing is they're acting as a middle person 
right? So that you have access to these things. Unless if I'm mistaken, it's the same things here, right? These catalogs here, is it not? Ebooks and e journals. Yes, it's the same thing. So it's, it's, yeah. it's really access to yeah, ebooks, e journals, and. But so my my, re my response to my response. Yeah, my response to that is I, I totally agree with you. It's uh, they, they were just misrepresenting that, and and sadly there were people that are not as informed as you are, as most of you are in here. Um, and so what they've done is they've they probably mm -hmm. hopped onto the bandwagon and they're going to pay that three hundred question. <laughs> now I don't know if that three hundred question is per individual or if it's per institution or something. It's but, paying, it's per individual per year. So in the case of an institution, um, like invest of they mentioned that. University of Zambia already subscribed to, to their resource. So for any other colleges or universities that want to subscribe, it's it's per individual, so it's per student. Um, yeah, and I, I find that disturbing, just like I find the idea of, and, and I'll be frank with you, and I know this is being recorded, whether it is this, uh, I want to put it uh, on record, that I find it disturbing that we are making a subscription for somebody to run a learning management system like Astria when there are people that are paid a lot of money in CICT that can do the work that the company that hosts Astria does. The thing that this Astria thing does is the same thing that Moodle does. Now I know, right, large organizations, there's usually politics, there are vested interests, I have no idea, but I'm disappointed that they're saying that UNSA is one of those organizations that has made this subscription because it makes no sense. Why would UNSA subscribe to Astria? Uh, they're calling is Astria a digital library or something? I have no idea. I, I don't know what decisions are made. I'm not part of management. But uh, my immediate reaction is I equally find it disturbing, and I think it makes zero sense. But here's, here's, uh, here's a thought here. This is where people think of themselves, right? Because I would like to think that you are invited, wherever you are working, you are probably invited and consulted on whether this is something that makes sense. You should speak your mind out. Right? If you're privy to these management meetings where you sit there and someone is saying, let's uh, subscribe to Austria, you can make, if it's, uh, I guess, a learning management system, right? If you work for a higher education institution, let's make a subscription because Austria has this service, a nice learning platform called Austria. Or you could propose to say, well, why can't we just uh, have our IT department download the freely available platform, set it up, and have them manage it on our behalf? What are the pros and cons? And incidentally, by the way, the last literature that we have looks at the pros and cons of open source software over commercial based software. Now, don't get it twisted. I'm not saying that uh, subscribing to these services is bad all the time there are times when it becomes advantageous for you to subscribe to a service because you have somebody else who does the dirty work for you. If you're a small organization and you don't have a competent IT staff, it makes sense that you subscribe to a service. But if you have people that you are paying that are part of IT, people that are in the library that in act as systems, systems are like librarians, why not just do it yourself? Uh, so, yeah, I, I hope my response uh, partially answers your question. I do wish I, I uh, had a bit of contextual information. I wish I was part of uh, the launch myself. I like asking questions. I would have been the one raising up my hand, and I know they would have been mad asking questions. Why this, right? Uh, there was actually an opportunity for people to ask questions, and I was very surprised at that. Um, uh, I think it was even on the news, uh, there were people from ZNBC. And yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's quite it's uh, uh, with, what you showed us, which is on the UNSA website. So it's basically yeah. ebook articles and journals. Yeah. Oh, by the way, so please, I'm inviting uh, someone I've been working with beginning this year, Dokowe. She's the deputy librarian for Zikas, but she, as part of her masters, she's looking at um, uh, integrated library systems through so website portals. You might be interested in this talk. She's going to be giving the talk after next week, I think. Uh, and we scheduled the talk in such a way that we have a discussion of that particular talk after we, we cover the integrated library management systems or the automation lecture series. So, so she'll be able to explain some of the things that she's thinking of doing, right? It turns out that implementing something similar to this is very easy. 
It's not that hard. An integrated port, and by the way, this is a bad example. A classic example that I would have is uh, Stellen, Stellen Bosch University Library or Cornell. Cornell. Good evening, Doug. Yes, hi. Good evening. Good evening, hi. Yes, uh, just to set the record straight, on yes. the aspect of Atria subscription on e-resources for Yunza, it's not there. Okay. Those guys are just the cunning and just meant to, it was just a business language. Me, I work for Invest of Zambia. That is not there. Unless for just for distance education, that is there. I thought I could share that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I, and the thing, right? The thing with marketing, and by the way, here's, here's another thought. If you're one of those people, right? And I have been trying to talk some, from the time I started being involved in this course, right? I, I always, I always, um, I always make mention of the fact that what stops one of you people or some of you to be able to do some of these things that are being suggested by outsiders? I mean, how hard is it for you to be able to set up these repositories? For we have sixty institutions of higher learning. Ask yourselves how many of these have institutional repositories. If you do consultancy, or if you, if you don't have a job or if you're thinking of stopping working and doing consultancy, that's an area that you can exploit. There's a company that I interacted with when I was uh, at UCT because I worked as a through project. They're called Admire. Uh, Admire, I don't know if this is a correct. Admire. What these guys do, right, is they they customize this space and they, they're making a lot of money. All they do is they just customize this space and they help institutions set up these platforms. All right, so the thing that disturbs me the most is we most of this consultancy work, right? Uh, we spend years, and, well, I guess a year for this particular course, and there's also 10 here, learning about these things, but we still have external entities coming through to do some of this trivial stuff, right? So, but anyway, just to wrap up here, like, like Adrian said, it's marketing. If I was... Uh, a person who was running a consultancy firm, I would make sure I choose my words very, very carefully so that I catch as many clients as I can possibly catch, right? And the moment you tell people, 300 butter, you have access to these limited resources, who'd say no, right? <laughs> I mean, and that's I, the way, which is a very good deal. Yeah, so, but what would be interesting I just have one question. How can, I'm saying I just have one quick clarification. Uh, because they launched, they were launching Astria Library. How come yeah. Unza has the same thing, the same name? Um, does, is Astria the same? Is it similar to Moodle? Is it just the no. platform? So, so it out, one, thing I've, one thing I've figured out is that uh, Astria is like a company. And what Astria is doing, right, is uh, I guess they've identified Zambia as a niche market here, right? They started off by providing that one little service, uh, which is the learning management system. Mm -hmm. But they've diversified right now. Uh, last time I checked, I think the, there was a separate uh, student management system for postgraduate uh, recruitment and processing and whatnot. That was going to be, I guess, introduced by UNSA. So the, the process of enrolling postgraduate students and whatnot is going to be handled by that particular platform. So all of these are, Astra is just a company name. So they're just spinning out products. So there's a product that is specific to this learning management system. We, are, we, are, we call it Astria, but it's, uh, I guess maybe the appropriate name is not Astria. Astria is just, I'm sure Astria is just a company. I could be wrong here, but Astria is just a company, right? Um, there, are, there are different services that they're spinning out. I wish I could, I, I don't know if, oh, maybe it's the library that people are talking about, I don't know. So Astra is just a company name, actually. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, it's interesting. Uh, but, but, but college is using the, the system. They're using, um, they subscribe which, to the system. Which, which system is it? Yeah. They subscribe to the same Astra library. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Here's the thing, right? What, I don't know what libraries are being, I don't know what content is being, provided here but uh, if if you adrian if adrian adrian are you involved with or are you aware of how the subscription service works 
what you will notice is I'm told, I'm not aware of this, but I'm told that uh, there's a consortium in Zambia which pulls resources Zaliko. from different Zaliko. countries. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Zaliko consortium. Yeah. So here's the thing, right? If you have Zaliko, why would you want to go to Austria Library, right? So may, maybe. Just, yeah. May I say something? Yes, please. Yes, um, what I understand about Astra is that, um, yes, it's an organization that I think Zariko has engaged to provide the service you know, for maybe providing in institutions with um, tablets, the Astra tablets, where they have put on, they put uh, books and e-journals on those tablets so that students can be testing them. So the consortium actually maybe individual libraries pay for for that service. Wow, yes, that's uh, uh, This raises a lot of interesting questions. A, a, a very close colleague of mine, I share an office with Abel Mukulama. He's yes. obsessed a lot with copyright. I'm wondering okay. if I can send an invitation so that we have a discussion about copyright. Now, if you're talking about putting content on libraries, yes, what are the legal implications of doing that, right? Uh, and, and even more importantly, I'm. Now, I'm, I'm not involved with Zaliko, I don't know what goes on there, but the question I would ask is, mm -hmm. surely you mean to say the whole lot of Zaliko is unable to do that? That sounds like a very trivial task, right? Probably they don't have those books, they don't have these books to, to put on the tablet or something. Yeah, but you're still making a subscription, obviously. If, if we make a subscription through Zaliko right now, why are you going through another middle person? So what, what implicitly, right, to wrap up here, what would be happening mm -hmm. is, it's like, uh, I'm interested in buying mongo rice, right? I know that there's a wholesaler who brings mongo rice to Lusaka, and then instead of me buying my rice to the wholesaler, the person who comes to Lusaka, I choose to go to another person who buys from the person from mongo rice. Uh, it makes no sense because what you're effectively doing is you're, you're probably paying more. Now, anyway, anyway, I, they, we're speculating and we have no idea what's happening. Maybe what would make sense is, uh, if time allows, we can extend an invitation to someone from Zaliko, maybe a talk would be nice. Okay. Um, Doc, I'll try to see if just I can to, Just a clarification, Doc. Um, just on the aspect to do with the University of Zambia Library, if you had yep. to check on the library, uh, on the Unza website where there's library component, yes. you find that there is um, e resources there. If you had to click, you find that there are databases there in showing, yeah. and you yeah. find that none of uh, the listed databases is Astria showing. So yeah. uh, if people yeah. need to get more information on the same, which databases that we are subscribing to, I think that component can really help us. Right. Under quick, right. it's just there. Yeah. Uh, in fact, so, Unza, for Unza, yeah, but, it's e that is using Astria library. Ah, I see. Yes, it's IDE. Well, well, one, thing I've not, one, one thing I've noticed, right, and, and really this is, um, I think this is characteristic for most, it's characteristic for most large organizations. Um, there, there seems to be an issue when it comes to collaboration working together. Right? Um, so maybe that could be an issue, this information. I wouldn't be surprised if IDE is the one using this. I wouldn't be surprised that IDE is paying money for things that students already have access to via the library. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. Again, this is where experts such as yourselves come in to be able to provide information that would be useful to people that might not be aware of what needs to be done, right? So, I don't know. I would like to think there's a librarian that's dedicated to ID as well, so it's interesting to maybe extend an invitation. I don't know who that is, but I'll look it up and then maybe we can have a conversation around this. But maybe we can quickly uh, open up. Yes. So the SNED works for IDE. Now, for me, I think what I would want to, the guidance I would, I would love is, okay, if any of us would like to implement something like that, how do we gain access to those actual um, soft copies of the books? I think maybe that's where the challenge is for most library and we tend yes. to say that it's not something we can, we, we, we can manage. Mean if you want to, if you want to implement it, we can implement yeah, it. These are, these are books in, e, mm -hmm. in electronic formats. 
Yes. Yes. So um, we don't have to scan. So maybe that's where the challenge is. So is it that we have to, as experts in the area, do we have to make a connection ourselves with the originators of that information, or we have? Oh, to I see what you mean. Yes. This is yes. this is where I was this is where I was getting at when I was looking at. Um, this is where I, was, I was looking up Cornell University. If you see this, right? This is a classic integrated library management system portal, right? Right. Using this portal, as you are searching for content here, you are searching through all the different services that the library has, right? So. Mm -hmm. The answer is yes, you as the librarian would have to make this connection yourself. So if you look at the UNSA, uh, now this is not exactly the best of uh, uh, integrated library management system portal, but looking at this simple interface, obviously I would like to think CICT is the one that came up with this, maybe Adrian might have an answer for that. But but it's, it's not that hard to, to integrate services here, it's not. This is a simple thing. In fact, it turns out that um, there are other platforms, that open source platforms that you can use as integrated library management systems. So things like, uh, ooh, a classic that I like using as an example is ViewFind. I don't know if you've heard about ViewFind. You should probably look up ViewFind. Maybe we'll, we should, we'll probably have a discussion about, about ViewFind maybe in the last lecture series, I think, which is after next week or something. Uh, so this you can use to integrate different services that you have as a library. In certain instances, what you could choose to do is you can go the manual route like the University of Zambia has done where you come up with your own custom interface, right? In fact, this is the same thing that I've had uh, conversations with people from Zika's University and they tell me they've taken a similar approach where they just have the simple interface that has links to the different services that they, they provide. And the idea is just to make it a lot easier or to have a centralized interface that faculty staff and students can use to access the services that they need. But it's not hard to set up this interface. There are open source tools that you can use, or you can use HTML, right? That HTML to come up with the interface yourself. It's not that hard. This is HTML, by the way. This is this is all HTML. It's not that hard to come up with this interface. If you notice this thing here, this these are all just links to services. Look at ebooks. I'll I'll copy or maybe ebook takes you to an authentication thing. The the ebooks link takes you to this. The e journal link takes you here. The e learning. Now, again, this is a very basic. Uh, <laughs> this is a very basic integrated interface. But the point I was trying to drive at here is that you notice that these links are pointing to different services. But all you are doing is providing this centralized location that makes it a lot easier for people to find what they are looking for. And in an ideal case, really, <clears throat> there's supposed to be a search interface here where if I search for content, similar to this Cornell Invest Library, if I search for content, uh, institutional, if I search for content, this search is going to search through all the different services that are integrated, right? Um, and then based on the outcome, uh, when I click the link, I'm, I'm actually redirected to a service that might be relevant, right? So, so yeah, I, I guess it's again to to sort of like uh, summarize your question. You would have to come up with the interface, or if you have an IT department, if you're a large organization that has an IT department, you can have the IT department de develop the interface for you. It's it's not that hard, or set up uh, a platform, an open source platform that would enable you to integrate the different services. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Okay, now I know, I'm looking at, uh, we're thinning the head, a lot of people have lost interest, we have 10 now. I'm just gonna <laughs> quickly, I, I know this was a lot, right? But just two examples of institutional repositories, like classic DSpace for CBU, right? DSpace for the Invest of Cape Town, this is a institutional-wide repository. DSpace or a subject repository for the so-called uh, uh, Southern African, Southern African Labor and Development Research Unit. Uh, I like using this as an example because when I was a student, I worked on this project and part of the task I was doing was migrating or di digitized content to this repository. I don't know if the interface has changed, but this was the interface that I worked towards. This space, institution repository, this is a subject repository for the uh, Department of Library Information Science at the University of Zambia, so we have a subject repository. 
And you see why it would be advantageous for you to do this once we discuss protocols. What we do is we pull automatically information that appears in the institution-wide repository, the distance repository. Uh, we pull content from there and then put it here. We can also synchronize <coughs> content what, that we put in this repository to the institution-wide repository. Uh, but also behind, beside the institution, institution repositories, we also have academic databases. And I think you've come across most of these as they're doing these feature searches, so things like SEM, uh, Springer, there are a lot of them. Um, you could view site CR as an example as well, archive. Uh, we could sit here and talk about these things. But besides, but besides these well-known examples, it turns out that you can view some of these platforms that are available out there uh, as being unconventional digital libraries, right? Um, and the best way to try and understand or appreciate why the digital libraries is from the perspective of the type of information that they're preserving and how they're preserving that information. Again, the type of content is the same. Text, images, sound. Text, images, sound, or a combination thereof. Video is a combination of sound and images, right? So Wikipedia is probably arguably one of the largest sources of information. What we're doing implicit is we're preserving the world's knowledge. Think about this for a second. This is probably one of your go-to places when you're looking for information. Granted, scholars will tell you do not cite content from Wikipedia, right? But that's besides the point. It's a knowledge, it's a knowledge repository, it's a digital library, storing vast amounts of text, right? Wikicommons is yet another example where you typically have just images, right? Most of the images that you reference in Wikipedia come from Wikicommons. I don't know if people have used Wikicommons, uh, it's, it's uh, similar to Wikipedia. It also uses uh, MediaWiki. Um, so it's like a Wiki Commons or something. Now I like I like using this as an example because I, I I upload images there myself because when I'm moving around, when I'm cycling, I take nice images and I upload them there. Um, but also when I produce artifacts that I think are going to be useful to other people. I provide, I make them available here for free, right? Via Creative Commons license, obviously. So Wiki Commons is another example, but it's not text here. You're looking at classic images, <clears throat> right? Uh, I haven't really been that active in here, but. Um, I wonder if I can check if I can see contributions. There we go. I last contributed in 20, ooh, two years I haven't been contributing. But you notice that I upload, uh, I remember I visited South Wanga National Park. Um, sometimes I produce, most of the time I, I do a lot of mapping, so I provide, I provide, I produce these maps. But bottom line is that um, all of these things could be viewed as digital libraries, right? So it's not just the, the obvious things that, that you are familiar with. YouTube, right? We are archiving videos here, vast amounts of videos on YouTube, right? Incidentally, uh, this recording is going to find itself on YouTube. Hopefully, and I have faith, 100 years from now, well, 500 years from now, some human being will be able to gain access to this recording. Uh, now, this is a message to that person 500 years from now. Uh, whoever you are, good luck, and uh, I hope you find this useful. But, but you notice that, I don't know if I'm making sense here, Preservation, right? Access. This YouTube itself is an example of a digital library. I don't know if people have heard of archive.org. These guys are doing insane things, right? I encourage you to go here. They're archiving things like web pages, audio recordings. The classic is how they archive web pages. Uh, and I like using this as an example. Uh, so using archive, uh, an archive uh, service called the Wayback Machine, you can actually view websites at some point in the past. So this is how the UNSA website looked like 12 years ago, believe it or not. We're able to do this because it has been preserved. Now you sit there and I know what you're thinking. Why would you want to preserve a website? Well, I don't know, but it turns out that Lighton has found it useful to gain access to a preserved copy of the UNSA website from 12 years ago, and also from four years ago. And then boom, now, right? So again, an unconventional way of preserving data, but we can sit here again and, and really talk about wild examples out there. The, the space is endless. 
because of the sheer amount of content that we're generating as a species, everybody wants to preserve content, right? Google Photos is an example. Think about this for a second. When you use an Android phone to get those photos and you say, no, I'm just going to upload them to Google, you're preserving those things, right? Hopefully, uh, if, you're on, if you're like Lighton and you've thought about what you want to do when you die, when I die myself, I've specified how my information, which is uh, owned by Google, is going to be made available so people are going to have access to that information. Effectively, what I'm doing is I'm preserving emails, images that I take, right? Uh, so anyway, I hope, I hope um, this was a good enough introduction to the things we are calling digital libraries. Uh, we didn't really look at a lot. We just looked at, uh, uh, I guess, the motivation behind these things we are calling digital libraries. Fundamentally, it's centered around preservation. We want to preserve data. Not only that, we also want to make it possible for people to access the data. Right? And then we had the definition of the digital library. Hopefully, we've now got into a stage where we know what, this, what, what a digital library is, what a digital library system is. Digital library system is uh, used interchangeably with the digital library management system. And we have the same sense of the wide application domains when it comes to digital libraries. Uh, tomorrow, we set the stage to look at some of the fundamental concepts associated with digital libraries. Unless there are any specific questions. Um, I, I do apologize that we are going to 21 here, right? Which is, <laughs> I, I didn't, I, I guess because we went off tangent or something. Maybe what we can do tomorrow, I, I know tomorrow's class is quite, it's probably one of the longest, so we will have to chop it up. So maybe we'll push, um, we'll, instead of uh, just going up to Saturday, we'll go up to Sunday maybe. Uh, I have a feeling we'll chop up next to tomorrow's class because it's quite, uh, it's quite lengthy. Oh, and by the way, these lecture slides uh, are available on the, on the Moodle, I'm sorry, on Astria. So can gain access to these things. Um, but also what you notice is that most of the references that I have here are the things that are in that module that I shared, right? Uh, so I hope this was um, a good enough introduction to the world of digital libraries. Uh, my hope is that uh, I'm slowly setting the stage to get some of you interested in doing a research that's aligned with this space, a very interesting space. You will see once I walk you through some of the things we are doing with the wonderful students that I work with that there's so much you can do in this space, right? Um, down from the simpler things of carving out a project that will make you automate certain aspects at work, um, down to things that are more esoteric and perhaps at the fringes of what people actually, uh, the so-called state of the art, the things that most researchers are working towards. Um, I'm working with students that are interested in metadata, for instance, so that's an angle that you could potentially exploit. Um, so yeah, uh, if there are no questions, then I guess I'll let the seven of you that uh, remained to the end uh, sleep or something. I'll share this recording so you can easily play it back afterwards. Normally what I do with the recordings is I mark them, but because this is long, if, if you are able to mark them, if you identify key spots in the presentation where we're discussing uh, specific things. You can help me with the timeline so that when we upload them on YouTube, people can easily navigate to those key aspects. So you can easily navigate where we, we are talking about the introduction to digital libraries, uh, application domains, for instance. Or maybe where we are having this wonderful exchange or discussions about your experiences and how we should move forward. All right, so I'll see you tomorrow evening. Unless if people have issues with the time, in which case I'm more than happy to change uh, from 18 to maybe 19 to 22 or something. Uh, but, or lunchtime or something if people want to. But I thought the 18 hours was uh, the most uh, appropriate slot for people. Thanks and uh, good night, see you tomorrow, thank you. Good night too.